Okay, we're here uh, this evening on uh, Wednesday, different night, June 21, and uh, we have a number of items in here, so let's get going. Our first item is a continued public hearing for NICIC, and this is for 60 Algonquin Drive. This is an application for a site development plan approval for construction of a swimming pool, and I guess we last heard it uh, on April 18th. Good evening, Robert Sherwood, uh, landscape architect for the project, for Joseph Nix. And we were in front of you a few different times. Um, obviously, we went through a long process with the Westchester County Department of Health to modify the existing septic system. Um, we've gone through ZBA for small variance on lot coverage, total lot coverage, which we are over. And we are reducing as much as we can, pulling off some of the existing driveway and the front walk, as we discussed. discussed. And the last meeting we had, really the big sticking point was um, the SWIP plan stormwater mitigation. We have, obviously, the site engineer um, from Master Monaco's office created two separate rain gardens. And what, what's happened on the site, as you guys recall, the driveway was expanded prior to that client buying it. And there was an actual, the terrace that's adjacent to the swimming pool now was expanded without any permits. So what we decided to do is kind of break the drainage up so that we can mitigate for the expanded driveway. And that is to the north side of this plan as you come into the property right on the right there'll be a small rain garden and then down near the pool we're going to create another rain garden on the left hand side there is a um, drainage easement and a, a ripped up swale that runs along the property line there and the idea was to create another small rain garden there to collect the water from the terrace and the swimming pool so we kind of split the, the project up to mitigate for those items that took place before we bought the property, right? as well as mitigating for our new uh, swimming pool. So we did get a, um, a letter from both the town planner and from uh, the town engineer, Mr. Uh, Scioli. You know, we got it on Monday, we ran through some of the comments. I don't think that there's anything here that we can't address um, with them. There's um, a variety of different items that we can you know, update with them and, and get those. So our engineer feels very confident that we can get all these. Done. Okay, I think Sabrina has still had some issues on coverage. What exactly the coverage was? So we want to make sure that. Um, I guess you want to make sure that uh, whatever you got received from the ZBA in terms of your variance was ultimately the right number. Uh, it could be. But I guess she was looking for some clarification on that, right? She was. She wants clarification on the building and development coverage. <coughs> yeah, and I did read her comment number read five. Comment, yeah. And I, I believe what happened was I did not update that worksheet mm -hmm. after we got the ZBA approval and we would, would okay. remove stuff. So that's something that certainly I can submit for to the our next submission. So, um, what? How much did you receive in, in your variance for the ZBA? Uh, what we'd love to do is to get to that number, so you don't have to bother going back to them again or getting an amended variance to get you get you finished. We were we were at a, a number of eleven thousand. The total approved that we asked for was eleven thousand three hundred thirty-six square feet of development lot coverage. Okay, so I guess it was your, your variance was 457 square feet that you received from the ZBA. And what I think Sabrina is looking at might be 683, which is you know, pretty close. So no, somehow if we can get it. The, the numbers are transpired or uh, transposed a little bit. We removed 457 square feet okay. from the actual property to bring us down to 11,300. Okay. With the swimming pool, that would be total okay the total allowed development coverage is 10,653 we were way over that with the pool we yes. moved 457 so that brought us down to 11,336 right okay so we're about what the difference between 11,336 and the 10,653 right so uh, what maybe uh, roughly 700 feet 
It looks like a 683 square foot variance, and we're down to down to inches here. I mean, we yeah. Got to get you to the finish line here so that uh, we can make it pull. Well, we're not going to. We're clearly not going to. We're going to do what the ZBA approved, and that was that 11,000. Okay. So I think that's the issue that you need to work with Sabrina on, and then maybe you know. I, it, it sounds like you're very close. Yeah, she had a little minor discrepancy. Yeah, I think she, at the end of her own comment, she goes back and says the applicant appeared before the zoning board of appeals. As for the ZBA, the applicant agreed to remove walkways and patio for 57 square feet and from 11,793 to 11,336 square feet. Right. 683 square foot variance to legalize the patio. So, Which is consistent. Yeah, yeah, with my plan. So okay. that's good. I think I think we're set on that. Yeah, just I would you know I would recommend you know, just confirming with her, make sure that you know um, no further curves here. Okay. And then the other issue I guess is just working with a uh, town engineer who's covered behind the map right now. Uh, her buddy is up there, and um, you know working with him and, and with Ralph just to uh, smooth out whatever he needs on the swim. So what I would recommend to you is that um, we need two more times before we take a break. So, so we can't do any of these minor comments through uh, 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 Bob, do you want to weigh in behind the screen there? You can take that off. Yeah, hi, hi to Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the board. Yeah, I think they're a little bit more than minor. I mean, there's a lot of things I still need to make certain it's going to work. Based on what you're designing, I outlined everything on ST1A through G, which has everything to do with, you know, more sections, uh, more storm events, uh, water quality volume numbers that should be corrected, uh, and also tables that show existing impervious areas, existing impervious areas, proposed impervious areas, and most importantly, sections through the rain garden, so it's ensured that you have a proper separation distance. Uh, so those are, those are critical elements to make certain this does work. Uh, pretty much S2-1 through ST3. Also, too, I don't believe a stormwater management application was submitted, so that's got to be submitted. That's ST3 and ST2 is also it's going to be NOA because there's more than 5,000 square feet of disturbance. Uh, general comments, GC1, GC2, a lot of them are just like drafting items, just for clarification, GC1 through GC4. A couple of typos, I guess, in the actual SEAF. Uh, and then GC5 is pretty much all notes, and that's all I have. Right now, Mr. Chairman. So um, uh, the first, uh, you can say the first one is the SD ones that are fairly important. So we need that information, and, and of course, an application. Absolutely. And so uh, what I would propose is, I think the cutoff for the next uh, for the July 18th is uh, the 26th. June 26th. So, Mr. Chair, if you can, and Mr. Uh, uh, so we have five days to yeah. accomplish. Well, don't worry about the little minor things because we can condition those. Right? You know, little typos, that kind of stuff. But the, the main thing is is uh, just making sure we clarify on the coverage uh, with the, the town planner, and I think you're there. But the other thing is just to have uh, Ralph get in touch with uh, Bob and get the, the necessary um, swift information in, and then we can uh, schedule this for the 18th, uh, and perhaps even uh, instruct uh, staff to have a resolution ready for you uh, on the 18th. So basically, you're not, losing any, you're not losing any time because we don't have a resolution now anyway, even if we close the public hearing at this point. So we're, we're really basically at the same time frame, but uh, okay. it's a little bit of work for you guys uh, over the next five days. I mean, if you're a day late, you know, we can look the other way for you know, six days, but I, I think it's the 26th. So we can work with you okay. as much as possible. All right, we'll get it done. All right, thank you so much. So we'll do that, and um, uh, what we'll do is I guess we'll continue the public hearing and um, uh, with anticipating that we can close it on July 18th, and also, uh, do we want to direct staff to draw up a resolution? Yes. And if so, is there a motion to direct staff accordingly? It's coming. I have a question. Yes. 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 Um, Bob Scioli, is there a plan to, to uh, empty the pole uh, the pool at the end of the season is that in there because if you do it fast and you do it on the ground there might be some additional issues 
Uh, yes, they can probably easily tie in the pumping system, I believe, into the stormwater system. Okay. Okay, thanks, Dick. So is there a motion to uh, direct staff to uh, drop the resolution in anticipation of closing the public hearing and in anticipation of approval? Motion. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, four zero, motion's carried. So uh, hopefully we'll see you then on the 18th and be set to go. You got it, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, item is a continuation of the hearing on the Yinti 10 Frog, Frog Rock Road. This is an application for a site development plan Bob, approval. Yes. There is somebody has their hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, on the last application. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, thank you, Karen. Okay, uh, the next item is, as I said, the McGinty 10 Frog Rock Road. This is an application for site development plan approval to legalize an accessory apartment and expand the footprint of the garage. Good evening. Good evening, Bill. JLP Engineering. Why? Yes. It's like SNL here. Well, I just want to see you often. This is wonderful. Oh, that's very nice of you to say that. So uh, we're pleased to be back here. Um, as you know, this uh, project, I'll just sort of briefly describe what the project entails, first of all, because it's been a while since we've been here. It's been um, February. Right. So it's a while. So the project again involves legalizing an accessory apartment, which is located on the upper level of the existing garage building. It's also supposed to construct an addition uh, to the existing garage, but it's not just legalizing the apartment, it's like making an addition on it. And with the construction, will provide uh, additional parking space in the garage, a new, a new living room, and, um, uh, and that's what the project will <coughs> entail. Um, and the issue we had at the last meeting really dealt with, dealt with the development coverage because the uh, building coverage itself was within the um, uh, permitted amount. But So we were seeking ways to reduce the development coverage, and there are several things that we had proposed. I don't know if you put a, is that you have the authority to do that? I, I could, would you like me to? Yeah, just the, the, uh, the C100, the first sheet. That's the demolition plan. Thank you. Otherwise, I can point to here. But uh, which one? C and the first sheet, C100. Thank you. I'm not sure what you see this. So, uh, find the places there. Sorry. Good to like. Sorry. I don't know what to do. Yes, I did. Okay. Thank you. Because it's technology. That's why. So, anyways, I'll just briefly go over it anyways while we're trying to get on the screen. So there the we reduced the development coverage by removing several of the, um, there's, a, there's a walkway between the driveway and the pool patio is being removed. Um, there's a, a walkway between the driveway circle uh, to the front door, which is going to be reduced in size, and a walkway on the north side of the house to offsite, uh, to an offsite patio will be removed. In addition, as, as recommended by the board, we're reducing the width of the driveway, which is presently about 16 feet, we're taking down to 14 feet. All in all, the proposed reductions. The proposed reductions. There you go. Mm -hmm. The Brown Project. That's the that's the next one. Let put that up. So all in all, the proposed reduction is two thousand square feet. Um, so that's what's uh, being proposed, and. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're hoping that the uh, 
planning board uh, will be, uh, uh, you know, will will find the the uh, reductions to be acceptable. You can see on this, there's a walkway in the with below the tennis court, which is shown with the hatch marks on it in red. There's a walkway and a patio space near the um, pool house, which I can either point to or you can see at the pool houses. On the left side of the property, there's a patio being removed and a walkway to the driveway. You can also see there's a walkway to the north of the house, the main house, and also there is a um, uh, the narrowing of the driveway itself. It's shown in, it shows in red, and those are the reductions that are being proposed. And as I said, with that, the um, the, the total um, building and development coverage together would be 21,463 square feet, 2,000 less than the current site. But it is slightly more than what it was back in 2007, which was, at that time was 18,755 uh, square feet, which formed the basis of the comparison that we had done. And that was the number we were trying to hit. Um, but that's um, what we uh, basically agreed to. I don't know if you want to add to that. No. So we'll leave it over to the board. Um, I know there were comments from the town engineer and the town planner as well. That we will address. I know the planner had comments. There were a couple of numbers of the coverages that sh she wanted to be uh, clarified, and that we will do, um, you know, just to um, confirm those numbers. <clears throat> town engineer, I have no problems at all with the comments from the town engineer um, with regard to the um, the items that he was requesting that we show. I'll just also make mention that we did we did receive several months ago. There's no objection from the West District County Department of Health. I'll just submit that. I mean, we yeah. don't have it in the file, yeah. so mm -hmm. we'll just submit that. Uh, I would just add that our client uh, met with the neighbors of uh, Could you give us a name? Oh, Michael Serignano. Thank right. you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. Thank you. Uh, Walter and Stacy Shershack at 8 Frog Rock Road. Uh, our client met with them and, and addressed their privacy concerns. Some windows were changed and trellis was added to uh, enhance the privacy of their, their yard. Okay. And then one of the comments was um, locating the neighboring homes on your plan. We always like to look at that in Correct. terms I of... Think, uh, I think that was like the aerial, which I tried to do that too. There was a, there was a, 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 there was a larger scale. There was an aerial, yes, you're correct. There was an aerial, plus I think there was a larger scale uh, drawing that was also submitted as part of the... Uh, does it, give us the, does it actually give us the, the distance in, in feet, though? It, it did on that plan. Um, I think to the neighbors, definitely was on the area. Um, it was on, on, for the neighbor um, to the south. It was 233 feet from the house to the garage and 85 feet from the garage to their tennis court. And that was the distance. I know there was a, I know I had submitted one with the, well, it was the last time, I, I, I didn't see the dispatch. And, and I thought I had submitted that. Um, that I think it was a comment from someone, I don't know if it was Bob or Sabrina. <clears throat> they mentioned it also. Correct. I will uh, confirm that. I thought I had uh, submitted that, so. Uh, I know the neighbors to the south are the ones who are most anxious. The other neighbors are um, probably equal distance. Uh, oh, it's um, number 12 on to the north. Right? Yeah. Like they're just looking at these plans here. It's about 230 feet for the neighbor to the west across Frog Rock Road. And it looks like a similar distance, about 200 feet to the neighbor to the north. On Frog Rock, as you well know, the yeah. Wolf Club is the right, right. So those those are the distances. The aerial shows it. I, I, I thought it had the um, the distances on it, but just looking at that's about what the numbers are. So it's a couple hundred feet. Okay, from the house or the garage to the neighbors to the north to the west. <coughs> to the, uh, Do you have anything that's in place right now to uh, buffer any kind of noise from the pool equipment to the neighbors? It's, it's so close to the property line. Uh, yeah, it's so along the northern property line. Right. Um, I suppose what we could do, if need be, is go up some type of, I think probably some type of fence is probably the best way to do it. 
kind of solid wood fence to do the best way to do it. Sure. Maybe on two sides or something like that. Yeah, yeah correct. So the pool isn't new. No, it's not it's no, been no. No. The pool is from the 1970s. Right. And we haven't had any complaints from that neighbor, but the board thinks it's important. It's really something we look at. It's, it's, a, it's a site plan that we're doing here, so, you know. I, that's fine. If the board feels it's important, we'll consider it. Okay, uh, do you want to run? Are there any different comments that we that we haven't hit or uh, we talked about on Sabrina's memo? No, that was really it. From Sabrina's memo. Okay, good. Bob, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, I'll go over it real quick. Uh, thank you, Chairman, members of the board. Yeah, the stormwater uh, net new and previous is about 2,700 square feet. So obviously they'll need to prepare a complete SWIP to handle that. That's item one. Uh, number two is provide copies of the on-site wastewater treatment system of the as uh, Three is just drafting. Four is just uh, drafting on what they need to put on the existing water service lines. Uh, five is the water service service main for the in frog rock drafting again uh alan just went over this uh sign no objection from the county i believe you got that alan Correct. also to a note i'd recommend to be put on here uh that prior to the issuance of the co the applicant submit a final as built survey so we finally have for once and for all once everything's removed good numbers on it should be done highly recommend by a new york state licensed professional land surveyor and he should certify to it to make certain everything's removed as a show and I just had one question on the plan that you show the demolition on the, on the demolition removals plan, Alan. It says indicates a potential future pool terrace modification. That is going to be removed. I'm not quite sure the purpose behind that. It was not included or deducted, but yet it's shown. I don't know what it's for. You might want to remove it. If you're not going to do it, it's going to create all kinds of confusion. Uh, could you explain or clarify why that was put on? Sure. Um, we, we actually looked at um, modifying the pool patio, but the McGinty's indicated to us that that pool, which was constructed probably around in the 1970s, needed some significant renovations at this time. So what their preference was, was to do the renovations together all at once. So when they renovate the pool, they would also modify the pool patio. It just seemed, um, uh, say, out of sequence, if you will, to modify the pool patio and then go in and you know, renovate the entire pool inside, you know, all the piping and everything else that's connected to it. So that's why they were looking at timing it that way. So at the moment, yes, they're going to just leave it as it is, but they know they have to do this work. So that was really the purpose behind it. Well, you don't plan on doing it, and it's not in the calc. So, I mean, I would recommend, of course, the planning board makes the final call. I mean, I would take it off if you're not going to remove it and it's going to remain intact. It's just going to create some confusion in the future, I think. But I defer to the chairman. I'm sorry. It's not part of your calculations, right? Correct. It's not part of your calculations. So I would also, I recommend, I, I would recommend taking it off also. I think what Bob says makes sense. Okay, that's fine. Sure. Okay. And then with regard to the SWIP, if the, if the planning board is uh, satisfied with the reductions that we've made, then we'll just proceed to do the SWIP. But it, it just seemed until we sort sure. of had a plan that was satisfactory to the planning board that it, um, it didn't seem the time to do it. Okay. That's all. So I guess the bottom line was for the board uh, to consider is we're still we're over the approval uh, levels for coverage uh, from 2007, but the uh, applicant has, has made a you know has, has really done a good job and they've reduced it by 2,000 square feet with these various changes. So the issue is whether you're comfortable <clears throat> at this point uh, still about uh, what uh, 24, 2,500 over over you know what was approved in 2007. It's it's there. It's existing. And so it's, you know, it's actually doing anything more would have to undo some of the things that are there. Um, so I don't have any real uh, urging to do it, but um, can I? Sure. Um, so I wasn't here for, uh, when this appeared. I don't think I was here right when you guys were here in February. I don't believe so. But, but um, you know, uh, Bob and uh, Sabrina's comments make sense. But conceptually, um, I think this is a win for the town, right? I'm, you know, historically been very supportive of accessory apartments. Enlarging the accessory apartment here makes all the sense in the world, right? It was 400 and something before, relatively small. Enlarging it so it becomes much more usable makes sense. And taking away some some of this coverage, significant amount of coverage already, um, I think that's a double win. To me, that's not like an, it's not like a, a trade, one, uh, one gain and one loss. It's a two wins for the town. 
And um, I, you know, it feels like um, changes here have been made in, in significant good faith. And so I'm, I'm absolutely um, comfortable with what's being proposed. Okay, good. Dick, your thoughts? Tom, your thoughts? Yeah. I, you know, I think it's, it's um, I don't understand how in, by 2007, the built, you know, everything kept going more and more, more and more. And to me, uh, it should be made even smaller. I mean, I see Alan is saying that that the uh, if the pool is renovated and the uh, uh, they could fix the patio and make that somewhat better, uh, smaller. But it's it's just just too much. I mean, I I assume it was done by some other uh, owner of the property. Yes, prior owners. Yeah, yeah, and so it's unfortunate because. It wasn't caught then. Um, so I'm not, I'm really, I, I see the efforts, the efforts are good. Um, but there has to be something that, that really makes sure that in the future, that anything that's built on this property is part of a, a visit to the uh, planning board. So are you suggesting that the planning board somehow uh, retain jurisdiction over this, this property? Right. In the future? Okay. Jennifer, is that something that's uh, possible or that we do or have done? Well, I think any additional coverage, development coverage would require a variance, an additional variance. So that's, that's a level of control. Um, and the question is whether there's something unique here that would um, cause the planning board as well to retain jurisdiction in addition to um, a trip to the zoning board. Okay. I don't really see it myself, but um, <clears throat> if others do, I'm happy to uh, consider it. Well, I don't, I don't know how, you know, these things, they, they happen out there in the ether and then we find out about it years later. And um, I mean, that's understandable. That's sort of, I guess, sometimes it's by design, sometimes it's just by, you know, um, innocence that these things uh, just pop up for a property owner. I mean, I get that. Um, but at the same time, I think that the suggestion that, I, I'm not sure I agree that this is a win-win. The, 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 the housing is absolutely, uh, I believe, a win. And I think it's a, it's a great thing. But I don't understand myself um, if there is a 4,000 square foot overage and we're cutting it down to a 2,000 square foot overage. I don't understand that as a win for the town. I mean, it seems to me that that's like somebody goes in and robs a bank and says, well, I didn't take all the money. I just took half the money. Now, I'm not suggesting anybody here robbed the bank, so it's probably a an inept uh, analogy, but I think you get the point is that we're responsible for the bank. And I just think that this kind of thing just, I think, first of all, sets a precedent that I, I think we ought to be careful about. And it sets, it, it begins to set sort of an attitude about the planning board and, you know, what we do and don't do and the extent to which we take these things seriously. And, you know, maybe we don't think this particular issue on this particular site is so serious we ought to be feeling like we're penalizing the property owner but we're not responsible for that purchase we're not responsible for that piece of property and all of that you know the transactions that happened and what happened without sufficient notice to the town all we're responsible for is that it be made right somehow and i don't necessarily consider a 2,000 square foot overage as a negotiating position um is is uh, appropriate for us to do i just don't uh, I, 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 others can disagree with me but i think it's wrong and i would say that we need to find more on this piece of property this property is how many 70 it's over two acres or a total lot area not quite two acres right um So my guess is that unless there is specific coverage that relates directly to the accessory building, 
which I think, you know, I, I think we would be, it, it would be a good thing for us to sort of help that get done. Um, other people have two acre lots and they don't have this kind of coverage. Why should, why should this particular uh, property owner um, get relief for, for it? So uh, I'm against it. I think that more needs to be done. I think you need to find it somewhere. I'm not gonna tell you where, it's your business. Um, but uh, I, I don't think we're there yet. Okay. Could I just address sure. that question? Please, sure. Uh, I, I think I would, your point would be well taken if our client was the guilty party for having done all of this under the radar, but my client bought this property in the present state of condition. So in effect, they are, under your view of it, being penalized with all due respect. Um, it's not my concern. So Tom, um, yeah. Two things, well, uh, a few things. One, I, I agree with you, first of all, about the whether it's the previous owner or this owner. It's before us, there's an overage. We, we need to ask the question, is what's being done to address that, right? Un understood. Um, two, the question of precedent, I think, is also very important because we get questions before us all the time asking about these types of issues. And so this is not to be taken sort of uh, as, a, as a case in and of itself. That said, um, each application that appears before us does have its own unique uniqueness. And I think what's interesting here is the overage, and it's the point actually you made, right? It was the overage is not really connected to ultimately to, to the, the reason the application is before us is for the apartment, right? And those two are not entirely linked, right? Is that fair to say? Again, because I'm new, new to this application, that the overage is, is just not, not directly connected to the apartment, right? Correct. Correct. It, it, was, it was there. Oh, part of, part of it is, a little tiny bit is because they're making it bigger. Right. Correct. So 400 square feet or something like that, but we're talking larger amounts as far as the overage is mm -hmm. concerned. Uh, and so, if there was sort of a, a closer nexus between those two things, I think I would be more in line with your thinking, Tom. But because, now, it, there's the, it, so to me, there's two questions here. There's the apartment, which to me, again, like I said, and I think you echoed, makes all the sense in the world, and I would love to see that go forward as, as soon as possible. And then there's the overage question, and how do we sort of remedy a situation that whether, not whether, it's not the current owners, they didn't cause that, but here we are, right? And it, it, it's, it's their property today. Um, how do we fix that? And I, I guess I, I would turn it back to you guys and ask, it, it seems like you've done something as to what can be removed. Is this the most that you can get out of this uh, reasonably? I mean, is there more that can be cut back? And one thought I had was, you know, your turnaround area. It seems to be fairly large and, and greater than what you need for actual turnaround. Well, I'll just say the turnaround area, we did run a, um, um, a, you know, a model of a, a vehicle turning around within that circle. And it, it just makes, you know, it's, it's, so it's not like oversized or anything like that. So when we ran um, you know, just the car or a vehicle, yeah. How long is this, sorry, how long has this been the existing condition? Coverage-wise? Um, I don't know if anyone really knows. I don't know. It's, you know, know that's some, somewhere between 2007 and, and now. Yeah, yeah. So a minimum of 16 years. Yeah, I guess so. Correct. Because that, that was the basis of what we were looking at. It was 2007. There were obviously changes to it as well. There was a gravel driveway at that time. Something was pointed out to was paid. These are all things that had been modified. Yeah. It was slightly modified when it was paid. Can I ask a question? Um, has anyone looked into um, what amount of coverage existed when the development coverage restriction came into place? So, for example, is there some portion of the development coverage that exists on the property that's that's grandfathered, that's pre-existing? Is there some amount of that overage that, that's grandfathered? Has that question been answered? Partially. 
No, and it's a good question. We'll look into that. Because the delta might not be as large as we're, we're talking about here, um, depending upon the answer to that question. That's not to say that, you know, additional development coverage removal shouldn't be explored, but it might not be as large of a delta as, as we're discussing tonight. I think that's helpful, Jennifer. Yep. Uh, any, any further uh, sharpening of pencils would be a good thing. But um, and it'd be great to see if there's something substantial in that. I suspect that there may not be, but it'd be great if there was, so we could resolve this. Yeah. Uh, my my problem is that the property owner, um, the existing property owner, previous property, is enjoying benefits from this coverage that otherwise that other people don't have the benefit of because they are. Um, following the coverage restrictions. And I can't find a hardship case anywhere here that says that, gee, we ought to be allowed to have this extra coverage. I would need some sort of, a, for me, I need some sort of, sort of a hardship case um, argument that would say, okay, I can understand why. But there's a swimming pool, a tennis, a tennis court still on the property. There's a tennis court here. Um, so to, to suggest that a pool house. So the suggestion that, gee, we can't find anything on the property. Well, you can't find anything on the property that, that they're willing to do, but that doesn't mean that they have a right not to do something. So I think that it's just unfair to the, the other people in town who otherwise might want to have more coverage to put in the pool house or put in this or a tennis court, but they can't do it because of the coverage restrictions that exist on their property. Uh, well, can I take a shot at the hardship argument? Um, the, the town does not require, as part of any transfers of ownership of prop residential properties in town, the town doesn't require any submissions or any reviews as to what the existing development coverage is on a particular lot. Secondly, I, 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 I would say 99 or maybe even 100% of transactional real estate attorneys uh, representing a buyer would not even think of making an analysis of, of course not. coverage. It kills the deal. <laughs> no, it's yeah. just, it's it's outside of uh, the typical analysis that you, yeah. and and uh, due diligence that uh, real estate attorneys do. Well, perhaps they ought to be required in this town to do that, and uh, and apparently uh, they aren't. Uh, uh, again, I'm not sure that I just go ahead. I interrupt you. No, no. I, so it's my clients bought this property innocently and with respect to any uh, knowledge or they certainly had lack of knowledge of any existing uh, violations or that the, the property exceeded the development coverage. The typical title report simply does a municipal search and tells the buyers and their attorney if there are any pending violations in the building department or any lack of uh, COs. Uh, that's about the extent of a, a title search. So. In the, my clients acted in good faith, bought a property. The improvements have appeared to them to have been there for many, many years. And so the hardship now is that they have to expend money to rip out perfectly good patios and rip out perfectly good walkways. And I think they're paying a price. So they're not getting a benefit over the neighbor who may not have found themselves in the same pickle. So that was my shot at the hardship. But wasn't this a case where um... Uh, the apartment, the application is a legalization of the apartment. Correct. So why wasn't that picked up on a CO search? I mean, I mean, that really is something that should have been picked up. I mean, that really is a problem. So after all, this application is one for legalizing an apartment. So I know, I mean, and, and you're probably correct arguing that, again, your client didn't know it was illegal. Right. But there's also this, the, the argument that they should have. And someone should have represented the client uh, on that issue, and that might have given some bells. But I mean, that's what the application is for. So, you know, I, and I, again, I, I, I'm not, uh, you know, you I, make a good I'm point. sympathetic to your to your issue and your, and your client. But I think if we could look into this legal background that Jennifer suggested, 
I urge you still to look at this turnaround. I mean, it's great that you can turn around a car in there, but most people don't have that in their front yard where they can make a clear turn without a hammerhead or some sort of, and I understand that the, the circle works for the entrance, I, I get it. So don't eliminate it, but maybe narrow it, uh, remove the stone from the, the middle. Somehow, I, I think there's, there's a fair amount. And even on the southern end of the driveway, after when you're coming in toward the, the garage, it, it, it kind of you know swings out there again if you can cut that as you've done up here you're going to pick up some more feet and that might help it may be that you don't need it based on this grandfather in question but um so i think there's room there oh uh, that would yes i i think so too i mean I, again i don't want to sit down and do it right. for you because that's it's your property but um i and unless jennifer tells me otherwise i don't think there's any legal obligation for us to to recognize this as a grandfather situation. And the analogy, I mean, you're suggesting that that he didn't know and they didn't know. And as a consequence, they ought to be able to sort of keep it as it is. I I mean, that's like saying, well, somebody robbed the bank, gave them the money. They didn't know the money came from the bank, so they don't have to get the money back from the bank. It's it's it, that argument doesn't go that far for me. No, I know. We're not keeping it as it is, but I'm not here to argue. Yeah, right. We're not going far enough. Yeah. So I think, I think I, 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 my sense is um, most of the board is saying that if you can get closer and reduce it from the current $2,400, $2,500 over. I'm thinking bank. <laughs> the bank yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you really enticed me with this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, just, no. yeah, exactly. I have to sort down here. Um, it, the, the square footage, if you can reduce that somewhat and, and get it closer, I, I think there'll be more comfort. And perhaps with this other question, not only more comfort, but be there without uh, any further um, action. Okay, we, we hear the board and we'll go to work. So, I mean, I don't know how soon you can do it. Um, yeah. Chairman Kirkwood, I think there are members of the public that want to speak on this as well. Yeah, yeah. okay, very good. Um, Carrie, are there hands, are hands raised or a hand raised on this? Uh, yeah, and we also have one of the apps, uh, the Emerald, I think, that would like to speak. Okay. Uh, Kristen McGinty, if you want to just unmute yourself. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. How are you? Thank you. Okay. Sorry we weren't there. We're celebrating elementary school graduation tonight at home, so we couldn't couldn't be there. Um, thank you all so much for your time. Um, we just wanted to chime in for a minute and just um, I'm going to bring a human element to all of this for a second. Um, I just want to remind everybody that <clears throat> I know we've all discussed the nuances of this home purchase. Um, we're good people. We bought this house with good intentions. My father-in-law passed away five years ago unexpectedly, and the purchase of this home was to provide a next step and home for my 75-year-old mother-in-law <laughs> in the apartment. Um, this is taking a really significant toll on her health and her stress level, and there's been a significant um financial implications supporting this whole process. So I do feel the need to get on and kind of just say to everybody, like at the end of the day for us as a family, this is what this is all about. And we respect making things right, but we bought a home that was in an existing condition. We are good people. We've had nothing to do with what went on prior to buying this home. We are trying to find a home for a 75 year old widow. We're two years in and her line is, I feel like I'm running out of runway. Um, this is causing issues here for her health. And, and now I'm kind of pleading to you all to like, we need to figure this out, please, sooner than later, because, you know, we've been patient. We're good neighbors. We've asked all that our neighbors have asked us to do. Um, this is becoming difficult, okay, on a personal level. So I'm, I'm really hoping we can sort this out. Um, and again, we thank you for your time and your input, but I, I just want to remind everybody at the end of the day who this residence is meant for. So I thank you and that's, that's okay. it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I ask a question of Jennifer here? Sure. Jennifer, is there any way to 
um, advance the um, the apartment um, while um, the application for the apartment while we figure out what to do about the about the coverage, or are they inextric inextricably linked? Can we sever these two things? Um, I mean, to the extent, uh, so I think one question is to what extent is the um, accessory apartment contributing to the overage? So what what additional development coverage is um, is being proposed directly related to the accessory apartment? Um, and with respect to that number, is the planning board comfortable with that? If yes, um, we can probably devise, you know, typically we, we don't recommend doing this, um, but we can probably devise a way to um, enter into uh, two different resolutions, one specifically for the accessory apartment, um, as long as the applicant is agreeable to remain uh, under the jurisdiction of the planning board for uh, additional review of the development coverage. Because once the accessory apartment portion of the application is decided that that's what that's your jurisdiction here so that 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 goes away <laughs> so we would need the applicant's consent to to uh to remain before the board to continue with the rest of the review that, that's helpful but uh, is there is there another way um if they are deemed we go ahead with the application for the apartment and hold that they are in violation on the coverage, does being in violation send it to us, or does it go somewhere else? No, no, you're not a you're not a um, an enforcement board, so it, that that's not a part of your jurisdiction. Okay. Well, are there if, any other if questions? I, if else? I made real quickly, though, um, the building inspector referred this application to us um, as of you know to get site plan approval. For the apartment, um, correct? For the apartment. For the apartment, and, apartment yeah. yeah. For the apartment. So, so the the jurisdiction of the violation lies within the building department, and the curing is this process with you. Right, right. Well, um, I don't know if there's someone else with a question, but what I was going to propose to the applicant was that, again, <clears throat> if you can step on the gas and get the whatever minor changes you can come up with in terms of additional coverage, and into us uh, by the 26th, we can schedule, you know, schedule this for the 18th with an eye toward uh, preparing a resolution and having you done. You haven't lost any time at all because we don't have a resolution now. So um, it's it's a burden on the staff, but um, they get paid. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, but uh, if 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 you can do that, we'll try to accommodate you and, and get it done. It's really up to Alan to you know to find the extra space uh, and then your research with Jennifer on, on, on the legal issue. But again, uh, trying to get you to the finish line as, as quickly as possible. And I think properly at that point, really it's all done. Yeah, so in the- I just want to remind you that there's, there's still members of the public that, that want to speak as yes, well. Yes, I understand, I understand. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thank just you. just wanted to remind you. Yeah. So I need the, all the reminders, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't given the applicant a number to hit. No, so, no. as a consequence, um, asking or suggesting that they go ahead and see what else they can find, I think is a bit of a sort of a black hole here for everybody. Okay. And I'm not suggesting we set a number, but I, because I don't know how we do that. I mean, maybe we can tonight. The other suggestion was that let's uh, encourage them to find what they can, but also if we can find a way to uh, advance this accessory apartment application independent of this right. so we don't we don't hold that up yeah but I, I my my sense is trying to figure out that mechanism is going to take us beyond the, the july 18th meeting uh, well, we don't have that meeting anyway yeah yes no, i agree on yeah. that subject yeah. so i i yeah i'd love to get you we have to go through really finished no we appreciate that we'll make every effort and again, um, again, we don't know what the figure is because if in fact there's some grandfathering and the 2,400 square feet that we're off really is only 700, you know, uh, legally, we're so much closer. But again, Alan, I would really encourage you on that 
the circle. Uh, I know uh, another issue, just a thought. I mean, I think Dick has spoken about this many, many times. If in fact uh, the macadam was changed to gravel, I know Bob Sealy doesn't give you full credit for that, but we sort of that could help also. Sure. Just a thought. Uh, you know, and by the way, it used to be gravel many years ago. So, just trying to give you some yes. thoughts and options. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, we have other questions uh, from members of the public on this application. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I am counsel. My name is Clifford Davis. I'm counsel for Walter and State Kerchak, who reside at 8 Frog Rock Road. My address is 200 Mamaronek Avenue, Suite 602, White Plains, New York, 10601. I appeared at the February 2023 meeting, and we brought to this board's attention that the applicant had not submitted materials demonstrating what my client, the residents at 8 Frog Rock Road, would look at the proposed building. In the February 2023 memo of the town planning department and the June memo as well, Sabrina Hull's memos, was specifically addressed at item seven, which stated, quote, elevations of the building addition should be provided to determine the impact on surrounding properties, close quote. It has not, has not, has not complied with the town planner's memo. No such elevations have been provided. Mr. Sirignano stands before this board and says there are no issues with the residents of 8 Frog Rock Road. At that board meeting in February, I specifically asked this board to direct Mr. Sirignano to demonstrate to us what the application would look like. How would it protect my client's privacy? What about the windows? What about the height of the building addition? I sent Mr. Sirignano an email. I called his office. Silence, radio silence. So Mr. Sirignano tells this board that there are no issues with the neighbors at 8 Frog Rock Road, and he doesn't have the courtesy to respond to my emails or telephone calls. It is unclear as to what these dimensions are, and certainly nothing as to what the second floor looks like. Now, all that we want from the applicant is that they send us the elevations showing exactly what it's going to look like when you're looking at it from my client's property. I don't know why that is so hard, but we're very concerned because they keep on refusing to do it that it gives us pause. And we're also concerned as to whether the patio is pre-existing or it is being expanded. Now, finally, while the which applicant patio received- Which patio is that, Mr. Davis? Excuse me? Which, which patio are you referring to? Well, I think it's, it's part of the patios that, that he submitted as part of the recent site plan. Well, there's, there's several patios on the site. Well, so, I'd, I'd like to from? ask the applicant whether He's creating any new patios or, or the patios that are on the plan are pre-existing. But let, let me finish and then he can address it. Sure. Finally, while the applicant did receive a five foot side yard setback variance, the setback requirement at that time and the fourth in that zoning board resolution was 40 feet. In the R2A zone, it is now 45 feet, it expanded. So the applicant cannot rely on that prior variance and then expand the garage from 454 square feet to 890 square feet, virtually doubling the size of that garage without further getting another variance. But the key issue here is we want those elevations. It could very well be that everything here is a non-issue, but if we had those elevations and we knew exactly what their application was, we could look at it, we could agree to it, perhaps we would go away. But if they don't give it to us, we're not going away. Thank you very much. Thank you. On that side of the building, are you planning any construction at all? My understanding is that the construction of the garage is going to the north. 
Correct. Is correct. So is there going to be, it all is there going to be any change to the no. existing facade there at all on the south side? No. The, but I thought I also heard earlier that you had met with the, the applicant, uh, excuse me, the, the neighbor and well, the, my client met with the neighbors, no lawyers involved. Okay. And they, they, I believe showed them a redesign of, of windows where it became a much higher window so that, uh, the occupant of the apartment would not be able to look down into their yard. And, and my understanding was the neighbors, uh, Mr. Davis's clients, found that to be a, a good solution. Um, Excuse me, may I speak? No, no not yet. Yeah. Right. Oh, is that Michael? Yes. Okay. That's my client. That's awesome. uh, no. <laughs> uh, the, and I'll let you address that in a minute, but uh, my understanding was that Teo Seguenza presented these elevations as part of his whole construction drawings to the Architecture Review Board and that they've been online ever since. So, can, I, can I just make a suggestion yeah. here because we can go around and around on who said what when. Um, you're going to be coming back anyway. Is there a resistance to sending drawings to the neighbor? No. So if we just do that, can we just get past it? And, yes. And then if there's a problem, uh, they'll come back. But it seems to me we ought to just you ought to just send them the drawings if you can. That'd be my suggestion. Right. So we can question. move on. I see the question about a new patio. There are none. So it's all pre-existing. All pre-existing. There are no okay. patios. Period. Okay. So. Okay. Very good. I think, uh, Mr. Davis, are you still there, Mr. Davis? You're there, yeah. Um, yes. Well, well uh, the applicant will get those uh, uh, sketches and drawings over to you so that you can. No, what, what I would request is that the applicant submit it into the town record because. It's um, in the town record if it's at the ARB. Uh, and well, again, the, construction it's is the planning board is the planning board, and he couldn't go to the ARB until. He gets, you know, his building approvals. So, you, you, you know, we're, we're putting everything in the reverse order. So, I, I, I don't understand why the applicant could not submit those elevations and drawings to the town board as well as email them to me. Because yeah, I, I think record. Sorry, Cliff. I, I I agree. I think that you know it's responsive to Sabrina's memo as well. So this is something that Sabrina requested in her memo yes. um, and should be part of the record before your board. Yeah, information that is submitted to the ARB does not see the light of day in front of the planning board unless it originates at the planning board and then is circulated to the ARB. Okay. Mr. McGinty, you had a question or a comment? I was just going to state that I met with my neighbors and we changed multiple things within the house and I sent them email copies of plans and elevations a year plus ago. And I have an email chain that says at that time, everything was fine. So we, I, I'm not sure if something else needs to be done. I'm happy to comply. I just want you to know that this isn't, I'm not certainly not stonewalling anyone. I want to work with my neighbor. I want to be a good neighbor and address any issues that they might have. But I thought that we had resolved this mm -hmm. um, and I can, show you the email chain where the Kerchak told me that everything looked good. Okay, well, uh, let's get it submitted. We'll have it in the record. And uh, again, see if you can do that in the next couple of days so we have it for the continued public hearing on the 18th. Sure. Okay, thank you. Are there any other um, hands up on this application? I'm okay. Okay. Very good. Just, just, just one second. What, what I would um, assert is that until those um, materials, the plans, the elevations showing exactly what the clients are going to be looking at and how large that second floor is, until, that, until they're submitted on, to the town, the, the matter should not be back before this planning board. But it will be submitted. If it's not submitted, uh, the, the public hearing will be adjourned. Thank you. And if it is uh, uh, submitted to us and we have it before us for the public hearing on July 18th, we'll consider it. Thank you. Okay. Bob, did you request that we have a resolution ready for the 18th? 
I didn't. So, um, but wasn't, is that not what you implied earlier? I did, yes. Oh, okay, okay. That's, so, all, that's all I meant. I, yeah. I, I don't know if we're still there. I mean, some of these things are, we've got some moving parts here. But um, uh, I'd like to be there. You know, I, I mean, we've talked about, you know, again, concept, conceptually, like the work that we do as a, as a planning board and how to help move things along. And, and this feels like the type of application that could we could go back and forth on forever. And I do appreciate the sort of the injection of the human element here that you know the, yep. these applicants are people and and that there's homes the people that live in these homes and and um that, that doesn't supersede the need to do what's right on our side but i just want to with that in mind i think it makes sense if, if we can't figure out a way and i think um we're sort of coalescing around a potential um path forward yep. is that fair to say i think so so i mean if, if you want to make a motion to um direct staff to Prepare a resolution for the 18th, I think would be pretty welcomed. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, aye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a belated aye. So I, I think it was four, uh, four eyes. So uh, anyway, we'll, we'll see on the, on the 18th again, uh, provided that the information is here on the 26th. Sure. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we now go to our next public hearing. Uh, this is Lada, 15 Surf Lane. This is an application for a final subdivision plan approval, an application for site development plan approval to mitigate the infringement of an existing sports court and declaring grading limit lines. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Can we just make a motion to open the public hearing? Oh, uh, this is the first one? Okay. Okay, is there a motion to open the public hearing? Motion. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Appreciate it. Again, good evening, everyone. Brad Schwartz from Zarin Assignments, representing the applicant, Megan Galato, um, 15 Surf Lane. Megan's with me this evening, as is Alan Phillips, who's out in the hallway, the project engineer, and the landscape designer, Casca, who's, who's on screen joining us virtually. So the theme of innocent owners trying to correct prior messes <laughs> of previous owners continues. Um, we uh, submitted an application um, on May 30th, right? And um, just to briefly summarize um, what's going on here. This is an application where the homeowner is proposing to install a 59 square foot outdoor kitchen. Right, that's essentially the nature of this application. That's what triggered everything that's down yep. for your board. Um, I know you heard from my client last meeting. Um, what triggered all this was a building permit application for that outdoor kitchen. She was under the impression as well that there were no pre-existing zoning on performance with respect to the property. This homeowner affirmatively conducted due diligence with the town in, in, in general in connection with her real estate transaction because her first home in Chapaqua had similar issues and she had learned the lesson and went ahead and conducted due diligence this time around, um, was under the impression as a result of that inquiry that there were no issues but lo and behold, here we are trying to fix the prior mess of the prior owner. We believe we've done everything the town has asked in order, in order to address that and address all the town's comments and provide extensive mitigation, including now a commitment to remove um, the, the existing artificial turf sports court. Um, and you'll hear a presentation from Costa as well as Alan and all those efforts. I want to highlight just two of the comments that were in the staff memos that I think were, were the, the two more major comments. One. I know that Costco has been talking to Dennis about demonstrating that none of the restoration areas would overlap with the septic expansion area. You'll see that in her presentation this evening. And Alan has been talking to Mr. Cioli about stormwater methodology. And we're prepared to increase the stormwater management infrastructure shown on the plans that were submitted in order to address all the stormwater runoff from the square footage that Mr. Cioli had identified. Bob had asked for more square footage to be managed than, right. than the um, square footage that Alan had previously prepared. So we're prepared to address those two issues and all the other technical comments. And we would similarly ask that the resolution be authorized for the next July meeting. So with that, Costa, I'll send the presentation over to you. Hi, um, sorry, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Are you really in Poland? Hey, uh, uh, I am in Poland, so good morning, it's 2 a.m. Good morning. <laughs> um, Sabrina, you had a question. Uh, do you still want to ask it or no? Hang on. I, I do, I do, I just have a comment and it's come up in several applications. 
Um, you know, everyone's quick to say that, you know, when, when they purchased a house, they do a title search um, and these violations don't come up in a title search before they purchase homes. Um, my office does a lot of the research for the title companies or, um, you know, when a homeowner requests to investigate whether there's any outstanding issues on a property. If we don't have record of uh, something being built and it's in our files, we don't necessarily do site visits. We look at our files to see if there's any outstanding violations and we track building permits, open permits. I just wanna make it clear for the board that we don't request development coverage information when somebody asks for a title search or they do a property search. Um, you know, we look at what's there, what's in the files, and it's only if it's a very complicated property and it's a request for us to come out and do a site visit, we do a site visit. So um, I just wanted to say that because I think that the board is being misled in, in, in kind of tagging responsibility that it should have been discovered if my office does a property search. Yeah, can I say one thing, Sabrina, to your yes, point? please, Bob. Again, if they don't file for a building permit, we have no idea what they do. A record. We have no record of it. So how can we have a violation on something we don't even have a permit on? So that's where this starts from. All the work that gets done that's shown up on these plans that we see now was all done without a permit in any way, shape, or form, to Sabrina's point. And, and I think the other issue is that in the past, even at this point, lots of these things weren't caught. But now you guys are, are using the, uh, the aerial photographs that are available. And when you can do those comparisons, you, you see, wait a second, uh, as, as we'll see even later on tonight, um, issues that happen, and that, that's the only way that we, we see it. That's yeah. a good point. I just said yeah, and and I and and I, you know, and it's not to say, you know, it's definitely apparent these are new property owners, right? And and we can see that from the records. But just to kind of give the board an understanding that we don't know if we don't have a permit, so right. that was important for you to hear. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say that that's not lost on me, uh, Sabrina and Bob. I, I, I'm sure I'm pretty sure I speak for the the board that we we're certainly not blaming you guys. I mean, you guys do such a great job, and 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 um, and it's understood that um, if if you had no record of it happening, you have no record of it existing. And um, uh, on, uh, I mean, I'm clear on that. Yeah. I, I, Sabrina. <clears throat> yes. Uh, thank you for helping me get on the program here today. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but um, I think that you raise an interesting point, uh, you and Bob, that that people that come in and do the title search, perhaps they should be warned that we, we, um, we don't, you know, what Bob and you said, a little flyer. It's in their in. letter deck. It, it is actually written in the letters that we send and we provide. Okay. They're, they're very carefully crafted to ensure that, we, you know, we can only speak to what information we have. Okay. Can I say one, can I say yeah. one thing? Uh, when I worked for a surveyor 30 years ago, 35 years ago, back then what they would do is when they did a title search, they would have the surveyor go out with the old survey and then mark up the new survey to see what has changed and report that to the title company. Now, I think that thing that went through the wayside and now I don't think no longer anyone wants to spend the money or the time or the effort. And that, if that still was enacted in all of these title searches that the title companies would do, I guarantee you they would find out a lot about these coverages, but they don't do that anymore. They used to do it 35, 40 years ago uh, for the old title companies, but it's probably got too costly. Yeah, and the question is really what what does the homeowner have to do in order to avoid this kind of situation? And that is really the question that the homeowner doesn't know the answer for today, not from the town, I think not from anybody else. Um, and that is even in case of our client who has taken precautions, who has invited and asked people specifically if all the COs are closed, if everything is going on um, appropriately with the property, because they were undergoing with a similar situation with the house they were selling. So they were knowledgeable about the risk mm -hmm. and they thought that they have taken action to protect themselves from that, but apparently not enough to truly protect themselves enough. Okay, well, let's um, let's get into the meat of it. Um, so, um, 
we have met before we've met in april when we applied for approval in legalization of a sports court on mr and mrs gulotas property uh, at the time we thought that that's the only structure that has been built illegally and we have provided some plan for mitigation um, of that sports court uh, as we received notes from all of you um, we've learned that in fact there has been substantially more structures that have been built without any uh, and disclosure to the town or permits uh, and this is on the map you see comparison of 2007 coverage calculations when the house was built and existing ones um we have we have raised we have definitely noticed that we have built this sports court with a little gardening wall on the side the questions were raised around driveway that has been extended some small addition to the retaining walls and the patio at the at the bottom in here where we were pr proposing to add a kitchen of 59 square feet so um as we've learned about the excess or all of those structures we have been asked to provide new calculations for the structures new site plan we have been asked to um, create new zoning calculations and we have identified memorandum from may 2003 in which the square footage for development and building coverage has been significantly significantly reduced from originally zoned for the property and that is being shown on this slide in a column two you will see the what has been approved in 2003 versus what was originally property zoned for versus existing property so in in just summary we are over four and a half thousand square feet um in development coverage while we are still in compliance in building coverage we are definitely just in a development coverage but substantially and we recognize that this number is high so we are no longer asking for legalization of the sports court um, our clients have agreed to remove the sports court and surrounding retaining wall of the property along with a little shed so i'm going to just move a little bit more because um <coughs> that kind of touches to another subject so we have um, we have been asked to provide those calculations we will have to address four and a half thousand square feet of over development we'll have to address also encroachments and or intrusions into a clearing and grading limit line as some of the structures are just kind of imposing themselves into a clearing and grading limit line uh, currently with the tennis with the sports court over 700 uh, exactly actually 700 square feet into clearing and grading limit line so um with that in mind and there is a lot of other aspects such as septic system going on the property um but they are not subject of this review although they will play a little role in this so i'm just mentioning them for for everybody to keep in the back of the head so uh, what we are proposing we're already proposing to remove the sports court of 808 square feet and the surrounding garden wall of additional 83 square feet we are suggesting to remove the vinyl shed on the side of 49 square feet um, and that really brings us back to our minus 881 square feet on the development coverage that we are also suggesting to build a kitchen of 59 square feet so we are so so we've so that's how we are reducing from currently 14,632 to 13,771 um so that really leaves us with still the number of 3,628 square feet over the development coverage on a clearing and grading limit line um we will now remove part of the sports court which will count towards the clearing and grading limit line we will, which is here uh we'll remove part of the wall and the shed we are also going to we are going to re retain small walls on the northern side of the property which consists of 58 square feet and then we're going to adjust the clearing and grading limit line substantially 
one on one side to accommodate new extension to the septic system on the other side to return back to town for over for 702 square feet so substantially more than we were being asked for we were asked to re now after removal of sports court and the vinyl shed asked for 58 square feet refund to the town, but we're returning 702 square feet uh, into clearing and grading limit line. And we're more than happy to legalize it and in, invite surveyor and make sure that this is being formalized for the future. Um, in respect of the building development, uh, we would like to suggest ecological uh, restoration. Um, and and into that, I would like to, because I understand that even though we all love environment, it never equals the square footage over the development. So I would like to double up the amount of space that we'll be restoring in order to offset uh, our 3,628 square feet of overdevelopment. So I'm offering 7,700 square feet of area where, where we're gonna making, be making positive ecological impact. Um, in doing so, and let me just refer, I've presented this picture uh, or this map to the town where I'm identifying three areas of work. This is a map where I, to which I have received comment from Dennis that he's concerned about overlapping area of restoration with this extension of the septic system. Therefore, I have prepared response. This is not being shown formally yet because we it wasn't a part of our submission earlier this month. But I would like to suggest that we're just going to move the area to in between the buffer of wetland a little bit further away from the septic expansion. Um, so hopefully that will satisfy Dennis's uh, comment, but it doesn't change the fact that we're still dealing with 7,700 square feet of the areas of for the restoration. Um, and that's just the grand plan. I could get into the gist of or, or details of how we're what we're planning to do, um, but I would like to start hearing your comments on this right now. What's what's the nature of the property that you're restoring? The seventy seven hundred square feet. Well, what it is. It is, it is a woodland. It's a woodland, and it's a woodland. It's the property of Mr. and Mrs. Gulotta. It's not an easy call, property. It's very sloped. Uh, and large part of that is a buffer of the wetlands that are surrounding the property. You can see that here on the map, we have three different wetland areas with 100 foot setback that really consumes substantial part of the backyard. That plus septic, septic field and septic expansion. The, the area that I'm proposing to restore is actually pretty much all the area that we can touch without uh, without encroaching into the wetland buffer. There is some, we are, we are obviously, we have a house and we have our uh, clearing and grading limit lines that are just going all around. Those are also pretty much at their capacity at this point, given the setbacks of the property and existing structures. So um, just, uh, I'm not sure I understood your answer to, to Bob, maybe you understand Bob's question, but um, what is the, the nature of it? You said it's a woodland. Um, it is a woodland, yes. But it, so what kind of restoration do you need to do there? If it's just a woodland, it's probably- It's a na native woodland that has been left to the nature for many years. Uh, the deer browsing has definitely removed lower and mid tier plantings from it. We see that they were replaced by invasive species such as barbaris, uh, such as um, Japanese knotweed. Those are the ones that are the most concerning to my mind, but also burning bush. Um, and I'm suggesting the, the native, the non-native species that are invasive consist of approximately 30% of the woodland floor. We would like to remove all of those uh, and native species and replace them with native species for the lower and the mid tier plantings in that woodland, which we believe will help restore the life and at the, at the lower levels. Uh, thank you. Alan, your comment? I just 
Also, uh, Pascal, I think also there were uh, blue spruces in there, which are in a state of decline. Correct. That's also so, part of it as well. I just want to make mention of that. Well, that so in the, not, in the north, yeah, in the northeast part of the property around area uh, of restoration one, this area is behind clearing and grading limit line. So, but it has been fully landscaped by, by the previous owners. We see a lot of specimen trees there, but also we're seeing blue spruces which are sick uh, with the needle press. That's a fungal disease. And they're declining, not only on Mr. and Mrs. Grota's property, but all around in the region. We would like to propose to remove them and replace them with native species that will be supporting bird life and um, and they will be supporting more of an ecological diversity. They will be also healthy. So that would be for the area number one. Actually, I'm specifying each area. So here is the, um, I'm just going to show you the picture. So this is area one, fully landscaped. Um, and we are suggesting that we would plant five uh, red bud trees. We would should like to suggest, well, actually, this is area two. And so free surface trees, as well as uh, red twig dogwoods and some ground cover such as Tiarella to cover and maximize coverage in that area. All of those plants are native and support the bees and support the, the bunnies that we have identified that cotton tails are being present in this area. So um, that is just for the area number one. And the area number two has substantial amount of uh, blue spruces that are being planted along the property in the back. You can see this in on this picture in here. They are planted sequentially every eight feet. All of them are declining. We'll, they are also directly over proposed extension of the septic. Um, we would remove all of them and then plant behind in a woodland, just as in this attached picture here so outside of the septic uh, expansion that area covers 5900 square feet of removal for the invasives and then planting our native species because it is important for us that we are actually not affecting too much of the woodland floor i would be planting smaller plants and some emerald bulbs and ground covers we would be also taking precautions to deal with the deer and help those plants to get established. Some of them are, well, most of them are deer resistant, but we should know that deer is a browser and they tend to eat on everything. So when we're planting to, planning to put some larger woody shrubs such as Cersei's canadensis red bud, we would use specimens of seven feet. So at least a part of the wood can, woody canopy would be outside of the reach of the deer. Uh, we do have a space in for that because the woodland is pretty well established. Most of the canopies is substantially higher than seven feet. And even in the long term, the tree has enough space to, to expand. Are you, are you proposing any canopy trees as part of your restoration? Yes, there's this canadensis. Depending on the zone, um, there are going to be different, different propo proposed trees. The area, maybe, maybe I should take you into the details uh, around the okay. restoration. Sure, Raps, please. I, I don't. Just one similar question that I had is the last application. You know, how long uh, has the coverage, the overage, been in existence? Do we know? This overage has existed since 2000, after, between 2007 to 2021. We have received from the town uh, and we were able to access also some of the satellite pictures and we saw how the property has been changing over the years. The sports court has been installed most likely around 2021. The walls, the retaining walls in the backyard, um, we see that those walls in the um, southern side existed already at the time when the house received the first C of O. Um, there was substantial changes made in 2013 
that's probably when that turnaround on the driver has been added and 2017 for that patio uh, lower down. This has been sequential and long-term project for the previous homeowner to just keep adding without permit on, on this property. Um, Understood. And then, um, you know, I'll be, I know there's more uh, thoughts up here on, on, on the side of the board. I'll be curious to hear from, from Dennis sort of the, the, the value of the proposed mitigation, because that's not my area of expertise at all. But I do want to commend the, the thoughtfulness, at the very least, at least that, that's how I read this, is, is a very thoughtful approach to dealing with a situation that is not ideal for anyone. But, but um, at least there's a depth of, of, uh, of, of potential solutions here. I, I'd love to hear, like, you know, from someone who has a, a much better sense than I do as, as to to like to what extent this is helpful and valuable. Uh, uh, but uh, to me, I'm again uh, I, uh, at the very least, I commend the thoughtfulness here. Uh, yeah, I if I could, I agree. And uh, this is a great um, report you put together. The identification of all these species and the, the character. I'm, I'm taking this uh, and walking around my property tomorrow. And, Checking things out. There's a lot of really good information, mm -hmm. but I guess I, I I I guess I don't need to hear all of the details that you're going. You, thank you for doing that. That you're going through because you know it it it's sort of like this for me. Um, that's why we have Dennis, and I, I'd be more interested in hearing Dennis's review of what your proposals are. Is that fair enough? I mean, um, also it's it, it's morning for you, but it's night for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Dennis, why don't you why don't you weigh in and, and just give us uh, say an executive summary of where where, you, where we are in this? My impression was that you were you were pretty satisfied with this uh, this comprehensive report. Right. I, you know, it's difficult. I mean, I think I'll start by saying you know if if I could take everybody to Wildflower Island in T Town, like that that's what a woodland would look like if you didn't have deer pressure and you didn't have. I mean, we have such like open understory and I always tell people it's great for shooting horror films but you know in terms of ecology you want you know more structure so you know I, I feel you know and this is for the board's consideration it's like moving forward uh, if you're not going to take or it's difficult to take I should say these already developed already manipulated already filled already graded already introduced material areas and try to turn them back to something that sometimes could be difficult and you know what you're competing against uh if it is even if it does make sense a la in this case like you know realizing the septic expansion area is a no-go so like at first glimpse it's like oh here's lawn you know we could convert that back it's like no actually that's dedicated to septic so then, you know, wh where do those other opportunities lie? And, you know, I, I'm not necessarily a, a, an advocate for like, yeah, you could just jam more trees in the forest. That's not, that's not, what, this is, that's not what this is, and that's not what's, what's being proposed here. So I felt, you know, overall, I tried to just do a summary statement in the beginning just to sort of corral that, you know, from, from, a, from a forest ecology perspective, like there is opportunity here and it, and it does make sense to, to look to the, to the forested areas. Um, just to quickly address your comment, none of the species are canopy species. They don't, they don't rise to that level of height. And I, I do make that comment that, you know, I think sometimes that's difficult to design when you're going to such an abrupt transition from this is going to start our zone of restoration and it happens to be a forest. So to me, those are more opportunities for field calls, maybe, where you could put some canopy trees and try to make it more of a, like the term I use is, relatively speaking, a seamless transition, going from kind of the developed property into the, you know, wooded area. So I, I think there is opportunity uh, for that. Um, but again, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be, you know, sort of like a laid out plan with a number of trees that could sort of be, you know, pretty, pretty determined. It's like a field, a field call. Um, as far as just some of the other comments, you know, at the time of, you know, installation, you know, you want to know what the spacing is going to be, what the, what the, what the size of the specimens are proposed. And as Casca mentioned, you know, I, I, I think, you know, deer resistant to me, that's at maturity. 
you know, when it when it first goes on the menu, the deer is always willing to do a tasting, you know. So and sometimes that could you know damage damage plants, even though they decide that they don't like it. So that's the only reason why I mentioned that you know herbivory uh, protection would also um, you know need to be need to be considered. And then uh, you know, which we we, we did address, um, you know, Alan's plan being submitted. You know, when I opened that up, I realized where the limits of the septic expansion were. So obviously, you know, that's not sustainable to, to place any restoration in that area because obviously the property owner has the right to utilize that if necessary. Dennis, can I ask a, what is probably in your eyes a very stupid question? Um, why is there no proposed restoration within the wetland buffer? Because the wetland buffers are usually protected from any sort of plaque tanks or any other activities. Um, we could do that with the board's so, suggestion or approval, what? but it's not recommended to be affecting the wetland buffers. And I, th I think uh, uh, Mr. Brownell may have commented that, you know, to try to avoid that if possible if you know other areas could potentially be be restored so i think the exploration was sort of okay. inside of those dashed lines at least i wasn't laughed out of the room <laughs> no there are listen uh, yeah yeah they're not, they're they're not they're not so um so where are we now um anything else Dennis? no i'm sorry great thank you so where are we now on the coverage situation well so uh, where are we? The coverage is what about uh, three thousand over at this point? Three thousand six hundred twenty-eight square feet. The proposal is to restore seven thousand seven hundred seventy-three square feet of the woodland on a three and a half acre site. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are also re re returning to the town 702 square feet into clearing and grading, grading limit lines. So that's a net kind of growth for the clearing and limit grading line. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, Serena, did you have any points that you wanted to raise? Um, I think most of my points were covered. It's really um, up to the planning board's determination on the clearing and grading limit line. Um, you know, so the building coverage is fine. It's a clearing and grading limit line. Changes need to be um, uh, delineated um, and quantified on the plan. And then you need to make a determination regarding the coverage. Everything else uh, that I had asked for has been provided. Great. Thank you. And uh, Bob, any questions, comments? Uh, would you like me to go over my memo real quick, Chairman? Sure. Uh, number one, uh, after I reviewed the uh, coverage calculations based on what they had in 2007 uh, to what they have now, I calculated about new and purpose about 2,800 square feet. So obviously that's well over the 1,000 square foot threshold. So I recommend that they submit a stormwater pollution plan, plan in accordance with 108A. Um, also, too, most importantly, over the years, they constructed several walls, uh, one along the south side of the parking area, one along the east and the south side of the patio, ranging anywhere from five feet to nine feet. Keep in mind, all with no permit. Uh, I have no idea how they built it, so I've asked them to retain a structural engineer to go out there, and I'll have to do some field investigations, and I want to meet, I would like to meet with the structural engineer, whomever that may be, to make certain that he and I are on the she are on the same page on how they're going to determine the depth of the footing, the backfill material, the width of the footing, the type of footing. After it's built, there are ways to do it, but they will have to do some exploratory work. That's number two. Um, obviously, I just put in here, Tom, the poll uh, stated that there's several permit applications that have to be submitted. Uh, for the stone retaining walls, additional asphalt, parking spaces, flagstone patio, walkway stairs, demolition permit, and sports court. So I would recommend, obviously, they go through and meet with them to see that they're on the same page on what they have to do, permitting-wise for that. Uh, number four, basically, I would recommend that just for clarity in the future, they put the clearing and grading limit lines the way I de designated here. It's standard nomenclature that we use on all other previously uh, 
amended clear and ingrained limit lines. It just makes it very simple to see what was previously approved and what was amended. And so I put that in heavy font. Uh, I believe Alan had said they do have the Westchester County Department of Health. If they do, please submit that. Um, again, six and seven is pretty much if the planning board is inclined to approve the clear and ingrained limit line as proposed by the applicant. Obviously, they would need a declaration that's looked at by town council. And um, I just put in there, I don't know whether the town, I defer to Jennifer on this, whether this uh, plan has to be stamped or should be stamped by a New York State licensed registered landscape architect. I'm not quite sure. I'll defer to Miss Jen on that and the planning board. And those are my comments, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Questions, comments from board members? It seems to me that you know uh, what we have is again a good faith uh, attempt uh, by an applicant to rectify a situation that they walked into. Um, uh, unlike the other application, we see a very substantial um, attempt here. Again, pretty close to two to one, if not more than two to one, in terms of uh, the areas that are impacted. Um, it, it should not go unsaid. I, I know, Brad, you mentioned in your letter that you know zoned for seventeen thousand uh, coverage. Uh, but this is a very special area, and the reason the planning board had such a restrictive number on this, uh, this property was it backs right up to the Kisco River. And, um, it, you know, we knew what the zoning was, but we, we restricted it accordingly. Kisco River, River feeds into the, the reservoir, drinking, drinking water, so we, we took extra precautions. Again, it's a shame, to Tom's point, as he made last time, that uh, people see fit just to ignore that. Uh, and in this particular case, it was not just because we used numbers. In this particular case, it was really designed to afford environmental protection to the Kisco River. So, um, but I think what, what, what your uh, uh, people have put together makes good sense and uh, makes the best of a, you know, a difficult situation that the applicant has walked into. Yeah, I, I guess I would agree that um especially since it has that kind of environmental sensitivity, the mitigation of an environmental problem with the, uh, with the um, things that they say they're going to do, I think, um, to commence the application. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, Dick, any thoughts? Uh, I like it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, any any uh, questions from members of the public on this application? Okay, not seeing any. Is there a motion then to close the public hearing? Or what, are, are we looking for any additional information that, that, that uh, we should keep things open here? You need a swim. So, Mr. Chairman, if I could. So, um, the declaration, the clearing grade limit line declaration, of course, the swim, Alan has a second swim to submit in the next six or seven days, and we'll get that in before the submission deadline for July. You're busy. <laughs> busy this weekend. <laughs> The two other items, the, um, the septic from DOH, as well as the structural engineer's report and the retaining walls, um, if we, we would ask that those be made conditions of approval. DOH is very slow and behind on processing the applications, and apparently the one or two structural engineers in the county that are doing this kind of work are also well behind schedule. So um, Megan's been in touch, she's trying to coordinate it. Um, so we just ask for more time to complete those two tasks. Are you okay with that, conditioning those, uh, those two issues? I have no objection to that request. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Good. All right. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Is there a motion to, um, um, well, you, you're good. if you get the information to us, we'll uh, have a resolution ready for you uh, July 18th? Sure. Terrific. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yes. At some point, reality is going to hit you. Yes. <laughs> the swift will be there. Okay. Uh, is there a motion then to direct the uh, staff to try to put together a resolution for July 18th? Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we'll see you soon. Okay, our next item is also a new um, public hearing. This is uh, Bert Shaken, number eight and number 12, Brookside Circle. This is for a lot line uh, change. D12. 
between neighbors? Yeah. Is there a motion to open the public hearing? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Yeah. We're here. Oh, I'm on Zoom. In, there you are. Okay, gotcha. I, it's, uh, I, I'm also overseas. Oh, okay. Exciting. Yep. So we have uh, it's an application for um, uh, you know lot line change between the two neighbors, and you are, sir, Mr. Which one? Burke. Okay. I'm Seth yeah. Burke. B E R K. Thank you. So, uh, um, you know, uh, the neighbors have gotten together and they think that the, the, this change in lot lines makes a whole lot of sense. So they seem to agree on it. So they're basically doing a land swap. And that's what the proposal is. Um, I know we have some uh, comments from um, uh, Sabrina and Bob and Dennis. So why don't we take those and uh, go from there. Sabrina, you want to go first? Happy to. Um... There is an a, on lot 34. Um, there's an existing non conforming side yard setback. Um, this lot line change would remedy that setback, so it would become less non conforming, which is good in regards to uh, compliance with the town code. Uh, I want to note there's no new development uh, proposed as part of the project. Um, and both lots will be zoning compliant um, in relation to the lot line conformance. Uh, Dennis is going to speak to the wetlands and the wetland buffers on the properties. Um, they are not affected other than reapportioning each of you know the the distribution of the wetland and and the buffers on the properties. And he'll speak more to that. Um, no trees are proposed to be removed. There's no earth moving. Um, the coverage requirements for both building and development coverage on both of the lots are in compliance. The action itself is considered a type two action in accordance with the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Um, and uh, that's really all that I have to say. There were real, there are no other outstanding planning concerns. Um, and uh, I'll defer to Bob and Dennis. Okay, very good, thank you. Yep. Bob, you had some, um... Uh, some comments, observations? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, majority, all my comments are basically just my drafting training on subdivision maps that I had to put my two cents in on. Uh, so basically one, two, three, four, five, and six, and seven are really all drafting items they can put on. Um, eight is the Westchester County Department of Health uh, regarding public order and public service should be replaced with a non-jurisdiction legend uh, because there is no new public water or public sewer being created and there's no new houses being created as well. Uh, and then number nine is, uh, I would highly recommend that the resubdivision map shows the most current wetlands flagging and survey locations. Uh, I know we've done that in the past, but uh, I defer to the planning board on that, but I highly recommend that. Uh, also, one of the things I do know, which is critical, I know the county will certainly want to know, is have to show the existing location of the septic on each property. Uh, it's always a good thing to know because the county doesn't want to create a lot line subdivision to find out half the septic is on someone else's property. So that's critical. And those are my comments for tonight, Mr. Chairman. Good. Very good. Thanks, Bob. Dennis, you had some comments? Uh, just to second what Bob mentioned, um, you know, in, in visiting the property, and that's why I included the photos, uh, you know, in just seeing the pond, it, it, there, there's more wetlands on the property, so this is going to, you know, sort of be part of the record and be reflective of what the conditions are uh, at that point when um, this is filed. I, I, I think it benefits both the current applicants to know uh, where those wetlands are and where the where the buffers are, but I, I think it 
also would benefit uh, any any future applicants just you know based on my four experience four years of experience here that people really do go off of these surveys and you know sometimes start advancing proposals hiring people whatnot they're just looking at where there's you know some aquatic or where there's water and it's it's more than that there's wellings that never will show surface water so i i, I believe uh when uh, the applicants came to us for a pre-app, I thought I saw a map that it showed that uh, a wetland was flagged. I don't know if that was current or, or historically, but uh, I think that would be a good idea to in, in, in have a delineation done. I would verify the line uh, if they want before they spend the money on a surveyor and just you know make sure that there's a accurate delineation on the, on the property. Okay. All right. I think it makes good sense. And uh, we, we kind of do this uh, all the time. Uh, again, it's a flag for future owners and uh, as well as current owners. Um, okay. Uh, Mr. Burke, did you have any questions on that? Just to understand, the ask is to resurvey for wetlands. This is all new to me. I've never done anything like this. So you have to spoon feed it to me. And I have the comments that you provided via email. I just want to make sure um, I'm clear on the ask at this point in order to move forward. Sure, I guess I'll respond to that. Um, you hire a soil scientist, wetland scientist. Uh, they would go out um, looking at vegetation, subsurface soils, usually to about 18 inches in hydrology. And in essence, you come up with uh, points along a line, a demarcation line that in essence best represents to the one side is wetlands, to the other side is non-wetlands. And uh, they'll tie, uh, you know, a series of flags um, to sort of mark that line, depending on, you know, number of flags depends on, you know, the shape and line of sight and location. Uh, and then at that point, the surveyor comes out and uh, would shoot those flags. I'm just offering prior to that um, that you know you you can contact me after the delineation is done, and you know who did the delineation, and I would verify those those flags because there are times I've gone out and have disagreed with a flag here, a flag there, uh, and you know, I wouldn't want you to go through the expense of surveying and then having to go out and do survey two flags. So the soil scientist is not a survey, that's an estimation, and then you would take a look at that, is that what you're saying? Uh, you would hire someone who has is in that discipline. It's not, it's not a surveyor. The surveyor goes out afterwards to pick up those flags that I mentioned that demarcates uh, the line where one side is the wetland and the other side is the non-wetland. How, do, how would the applicant get the, um, the uh, delineations and demarcations of the septic? Where, where do they get that information? I turn that over to Bob. That's a lot. <laughs> See you I, we know where the septic is. I, 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 we have both properties know where their septic tanks and fields are. Okay. So we would just have to have that marked on, on the map. And uh, again, uh, so we could show to um, show the Westchester DOH that we're all set. That part's easy. Good. Okay. Good. Um, let's see. Did we open the? We did open the public hearing. I hope we did. Okay. Good. Excellent. Are there any comments from board members or any comments from the, the public on this application? For me. It seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. Dick, anything at all? Any comment, Dick? Okay. Um, okay, Sabrina, I think you mentioned somewhere here that um, while you didn't really recommend, you wouldn't object if we waived our uh, jurisdiction, but I, I, I think we need to get this information on the septic and the, uh, the wetland delineation, so perhaps we ought not to do it in this case. Yeah, it's really up to the pleasure of the board. Um, I do think that uh, to address Dennis's comments and to get that done, um, you may want to keep the public hearing open um, yep. until such time as that information is received and then close the public hearing and direct to approval if everything is uh, in keeping with what you expect. Right. I think that's good. Yeah, I think that makes good sense in this case. So uh, what we'll do is we'll wait to hear back from the, the applicants when you have the wetland work done and the markings of uh, the uh, septics and uh, just let us know when you're ready and uh, 
we'll, we'll set you up for a meeting for the uh, continuation of this public hearing, and then we'll get set with a resolution, and off you go. And do we have to continue to it to a date? Oops. Yeah, you have to, in order to avoid having to re-notice the whole public hearing, we need to set a date tonight. If the applicant is not ready at that time, we can always adjourn it further by putting it on the agenda and, and marking it as adjourned, but we need right. to set a date tonight. It's probably one of the September dates, I would think, at this point. <clears throat> Our first September meeting is September 6th with the submission deadline of August 14th. So if you get the wetland work done by August 14th, we'll, we can see you on September 6th. Uh, after that, we probably have one, what, uh, two weeks later? September 19th with the deadline of August 28th. Okay. So we leave it to the applicant. Uh, uh, why don't we, well, we, we can't. <laughs> why we can't we... leave it to them. Um, Mr. Burke, do you have a sense of, um... You know, you learned tonight that you have to have it flagged and verified. That should that will take August. Uh, the question is, do you think um, for you and the Shakens is early September or mid September better for you? I mean, it's hard to say because I have no idea how. I've never called a soil scientist before, and Dennis do any of. So if, if it helps, um, we're not allowed to recommend anyone, but what I try to do for applicants is, thankfully our good neighbors in New England and Greenwich, Connecticut have a list of about 15 soil scientists, and I would say at least eight to 10 of those names you would recognize as having done work in Newcastle if you go through the applications, and I'm happy to email that to you and get that process started. Um, I don't see that taking more than, I mean, a day would be an extreme. I would say, based on your property and the line, it would be a half a day uh, to, to complete that. And at that point, um, you'd be able to contact me, and then you'd have to probably line up with a surveyor, be ready to uh, shoot those flags and make it part of the uh, submission. Got it. Okay, yeah, if you can email that to me, I'll take a look and work on scheduling it. So. So, um, so maybe, so maybe to be more conservative, let's shoot for the second meeting in August. September. Or se meeting. September. I'm sorry, we're not meeting in August. Nineteenth, right? Nineteenth. Okay. Nineteenth. That sounds good. So, so, what is that? The when does it have to be submitted by? August twenty eighth. Okay. And the meeting would be September. Sorry. Nineteenth. Nineteenth. Got it. Okay. And if for some reason you're not going to make that meeting, then you need I'll to send you know. an email to us asking to adjourn it to the next date. Okay, and I'll look for the email from um, Dennis. I believe it was Dennis who said uh, yes. with the link to the various soil scientists. Okay, yep. great. Perfect, Super. thank you. Enjoy your trip. Thanks very much. Okay, yep, be well. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Yeah. Okay, our next item is the resolution for Driscoll. This is 143 Armonk Road, the application for the accessory apartment site that we heard back on June 6th. So uh, that was sent to us uh, today. Uh, in the um, resolution, we don't have the motion and... Okay, that's, that's what we're doing right now. Excuse me. John Parking with you. Okay. Um, have you, uh, has the applicant already gone to the ZBA for the variance for the, uh, the coverage? No, we've uh, made application for the building department. We got a, we got a letter of denial and uh, everything's in process for zoning board in July. Well, one thing that we might want to do is just give you a letter of support. Um, that yeah, that's the that, way things are going these days, but <laughs> we can do that if you wish. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, that would be good. Uh, we do have a, a, a development coverage issue yeah. uh, that, that um, uh, Mr. Scioli is going to take a site visit. Maybe a letter of support and a comment on... Or, or the result of his site visit would be great for the zoning board because uh, uh, that would that would be great. I don't know if that's possible, but if there's a letter of support, I'd like to have 
I'd like yeah. to have Bob's opinion on our gravel portion of the property. That's quite a bit, quite a big area, a couple of thousand. Right. Feet. Well, we can certainly, you know, send our letter of support. I think Bob would have to do his own. We, I don't want to hold up our letter for him. Yeah. Uh, All right. If you think, if you think it might help, uh, we're happy to do it. I think. I think so. Yeah. And I, I also like to comment on the, the resolution uh, in, on page one, it says the proposed accessory apartment would contain one bedroom, which it will, but it would, it will take, it's two bathrooms. Well, one outer room and one full bathroom, but more importantly, it has one parking space, not three. Oh, okay. Uh, I would like to get that changed. Okay, one parking space and what, what would say one and a half bathrooms then? Yes, that would be better. Okay. All right. That's it. That's okay. all I have. Good. Any other comments from staff or board members? No. If not, is there a motion to uh, adopt the resolution as amended? No, so okay, second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. We're all set. Thank you so much. Good night. Try to remember, try to remember to do the letter. But... Good night, Chuck. Good yeah, night. Good night. Okay, I'm going to uh, take a 15 minute uh, break to help my wife with something. All right, with medication. Sure, sure. Thank you, dude. Do you so want I'll, me to? I'll be back in 15. So this is VA? That would be great, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Our next item is an informal appearance before the board. This is Graves 123 for a Random Farms Drive, an application for a site development plan approval to replace and expand a deck into the clearing grading limit lines and the removal of the basketball court. Good evening. It's been a while. Yes, Mr. Tesco. How are you? Good. Um, the issue at hand is that the tenant client uh, decided to build, rebuild a uh, deck. Turns out the deck was fell into the environmental conservation area. And you, you have a site plan, so you know, you, you yes. right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, that intrusion um, does not affect the setbacks. It doesn't affect the conservation. The setback is 60, the conservation is 70. Um, the deck, when I came on board, was already framed. So all I, my responsibility at that time was to provide a set of working drawings for the construction, for the building part. We did that and then uh, things kind of got out of hand. <laughs> In that um, the uh, conservation area is a major issue. Uh, I'll let our consultant talk about that. Uh, what I'm more or less interested in is seeing to whether, whether or not the board will approve the intrusion into the conservation area, which is a little small area of the deck. But you have this drawing. There's a little corner here and a little corner there, and the stairs. That, as far as my part of it is concerned, is the issue at hand. I'll let Mr. Paul going to take care of the, uh, the rest of the issues, which is all the environmental stuff. Yep. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, uh, for the record. My name is Paul Jane. I was uh, brought on board uh, recently to delineate wetlands and to develop some work with uh, Paul as developing a site plan that addressed the, uh, issues that came up at the first or last meeting that um, Earl had with the planning board. So um, <clears throat> Dennis, Sabrina, and Bob had comments um, at the prior planning board meeting and we put together the site plan. The first thing that was asked by Dennis was, are there any wetlands other than the site? And to that end, I prepare a, a wetland survey. This is just a 
part of the original report, just so you don't have to fart around with it, looking through your files. And you see, based on the uh, field work that it did, uh, you see in Chartreuse two wetland areas. One is actually to the north of Earl's site, just off site. And the other one is to the uh, east of his property on Hog Hill Road. And, uh, so the wetlands are off site? Correct. And, um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, we put them on the map. And I'm going to now go over to the uh, right site plan. But I think on one of the plans, not this one, but you show the buffer on this, this plan here. That's why I'm going to go over there. So okay. uh, I'm going to pass out this is so you don't have to open up your. This is just a blow off a reduction of my site plan. Oh, you've already got them open, sorry. You need to take that uh, microphone with you. No, I don't know. No, you do. For the public. Oh, if you're going to go over there, you need to take the mic with you. Oh, yeah, yeah that's a good idea. Oh, okay. It does come off. No, you don't have to take the whole thing. I don't want to do a. Uh, just pull it out. There you go. Like Jagger or anything. <laughs> Also, because we can't see the plans, if we can tilt them a little bit. Oh, put them where you'll you know, okay. like. Yeah. So we got close, but we have we have a site plan that we've prepared, and uh, there, there's two graphics on it of the site, and the first one uh, I always like to put together a, uh, an existing conditions. So we'll just walk you through it. Uh, the existing conditions shows the residents, the uh, basketball court driveway and the area that's not colored that's lawn area everything that's brown are predominantly on the borders of the property and along the driveway and between the uh, basketball court and the uh, driveway those are primarily very well established landscaped plantings and by and large that's pretty much what makes up the vegetative cover that isn't lawn on the girl's property. And really, it's very pretty. I mean, you must have spent a king's ransom to do it, but it, it's there. And, uh, and we've, we've delineated in some areas what most of them are, but there's a variety of uh, you know, cedars and rhododendrons and things of that sort. Now, on the northern end of the property, and here's where my finger is, that's, that's this, excuse me, this property line is right here. There's an area over here that the lawn actually uh, encroaches just onto the neighbor's property, and, and it appears to be, for all intents and purposes, no physical demarcation of the boundary, so it's actually maintained as lawn. And probably by Earl, unbeknownst to him, he's doing some maintenance on his neighbor's property. And there are some planted viburnums, very, very nicely established. They're over six feet tall, that are uh, planted in and along this area. And I, Earl can speak to this, but it looks like Earl's probably installed them. They're, they're really quite you know, well established. And there's a, a mulch cover that makes up not only this area, but also some of the woodland area that is pretty much undisturbed. So you can kind of see that uh, what we'd like to do uh, is, uh, in our proposal, is to, along our property line, the northern property line, it's lawn, we're going to take a buffer area of the lawn and remove it and put a, a group of plantings that we selected and keyed over here. And it's basically a, a, to give it some structure, some trees, shrubs, herbaceous ground covers. And this would be from where the property line is, a buffer area. We'd remove some lawn. The other thing that we'd like to propose is he's got an existing asphalt court, and we'd like to remove that. And we've calculated the, uh, the areas of removal and area of proposed mitigation. And we've calculated approximately uh, 1,900 uh, square feet of uh, removal of basketball cover and revegetation, removal of lawn, approximately 1,400 square feet, 
and we're proposing, proposing about 3,300 square feet of mitigation. And that's consisting of the removal of the basketball court and the removal of a lawn buffer that's on our side of the property. We've also shown on our proposal the will you proposal. Remove, will you be removing the walkway that goes out to the basketball court? That was brought up by the town engineer in a comment that I just saw uh, from um, maybe a day or two ago. We have no objection to removing that. And I believe he made remarks about a retaining wall that forms an L. Uh, this actually, this side is a retaining wall. Uh, on around part, an enclosure around part of the court. We elected on our plan not to remove that just to reduce the amount of excess disturbance, but we have no objection to removing it. But that, Sorry, go ahead. that was the reason why we didn't remove it. Right. It was just to reduce the disturbance. And with regards to the disturbance, we, uh, we consider the disturbance to be limited to the footings of the proposed or under construction new deck and the, and the stoop area, the stairs and the stoop, to be the, the disturbances related to that. And then the other disturbance is the removal of the, the basketball court. We're not changing any grading. So in other words, we're not doing any regrading around the deck and stoop. And we're also not doing any regrading on the basketball court. We're replacing that asphaltic surface and subgrade that might be there and, and putting on, as we've outlined in our, our plan, uh, a topsoil cover and receding it. So we're not going to change the grades at all. But we have no problem with removing the, uh, uh, the small retaining wall, but there'll be disturbances related to that. Do you have a sketch that, that sets forth the, the approved current clear and grading limit lines? Well, um, the answer is... Uh, they're, they're limited to the uh, uh, the deck and the removal of the uh, basketball court, but we, I mean we, we could we can put anything. You know, well, uh, 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 Norm, this was a conservation uh, development, so normally we have uh, pretty clear clear and grain limit lines. Sure. And I'm also wondering whether or not there were any um, property. Uh, buffer lines along the uh, property lines, you know, uh, along the Hog Hill, along one Sure, so, so I, I what I can show you is on the side plane, we have, I have two lines, and there, one, one, uh, Mr. Scioli had a comment that we should show uh, the entire yes. line. We'll do that. Right. We didn't show it, but we will. And I've got on here the uh, zoning setback line, and then this, excuse me, the conservation line. And then the uh, the zoning setback line uh, on the deck, and with regards to the wetlands, the hundred foot setback yep, is there, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we're working within the buffer to remove that. But the deck, we're out of the woods there. Yep. Now uh, they had asked that we have these surveyed in. We did not have the time to turn around to get it in, but we actually have a surveyor that's picking it up. So that's in the works. But, you know, we feel confident we'll be out of the woods there. Erosion control measures. We're establishing silt fencing uh, just down to the uh, deck. And then also a silt fence right on the property line, on the north end property line, just so nothing sloughs off. The grades that were doing any of this disturbance, I mean, that's, they're all very gently sloped areas. What, what now the access... How does this, how does this property slope? Yeah, so we have a topography on the, yeah. on the site plan, yeah. two foot concrete walls. The house is pretty much the high point, and just like a shield, it gently slopes in all directions, except for one. On this side of the driveway, there's a couple of boulder retaining walls, so it steps down, but all the areas that we're working in are uh, gently sloped. Our access or staging area would be right where the driveway turnaround is, and our intent, and I've shown here the access route, we'd come around here and stay uphill of the silt fence and do all our work related to this. Now, we could make a nice haul road, but we don't, our intent is to bring a bobcat with uh, rubber tires, much like hiring a landscape company that's moving your shrubs on the site. So I think 
any dis could be de minimis as far as uh, you'd be able to walk over the lawn. They would jackhammer to bust this up and then just remove it with a bobcat. So, um, you know, it, we, we don't have heavy equipment. Anymore. A lot of it, we, all of the jackhammer would be done by hand, of course. Um, all the details related to the plantings and how we go about doing all the work and the construction sequence are all outlined here on the plans. We also have a prohibition on uh, use of herbicides and pesticides in all the regulated areas. We would not do that anymore. So um, I can't speak to what the restrictions are as far as the conservation easement goes with the stoop and stairs and uh, two corners of the deck. I, that, that's something that you know, you're going to have to see if that's something you can work with Earl on. But we do feel that we're offering a substantive. We're sinners here, but we're big saints, I think, as far as cleaning up some things that were not done properly as far as COs. Yeah. And that's a big item is the basketball court and installing a buffer along our property line to the wetland that's not on our property. So I think at the end of the day, we. We're, uh, we're, we're doing something that's tipping it quite favorably. Uh, okay, so if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Sabrina, get uh, thoughts? Sorry, did you hear? I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I was having some technical issues. Um, so for the under the State Environmental Quality Review Act, this application does not require any further review. Um, the, in accordance with the building inspector's interpretation of yards, the property contains three front yards. Um, so that's important to note, uh, at the time that this subdivision was approved, the front yard setback was 50 feet. It has since been changed. It is now 60 feet. So, um, it is, uh, it is a legal non-conforming, uh, front yard setbacks right now. Um, the coverage calculations is where that's where we kind of run into some issue. Um, the deck, as you know, is being slightly enlarged and the basketball court is being removed. Um, you know, I had asked for information to properly identify the size and the quantities of, imp of building and development coverage. Um, there's some errors that I picked up between the worksheets and the uh, information provided in the application, and I've asked for revised worksheets to be provided so that those clarifications can be made and the planning board has full understanding of whether or not uh, whether or not there are violations with building and development coverage and what the amount of building and development coverage is. Um, no information has been um, provided regarding the removal of the walkway to the basketball court. Uh, that, that is a question. And the, um, the, the orientation of the deck in relation to the clearing and grading limit line uh, probably should be revisited by the planning board. Um, and then there needs to be additional information regarding mitigation plantings for the removal of the basketball court. Sabrina, when you mentioned the orientation of the deck, uh, the clearing So when the right original now. deck on this property was carefully developed and crafted so that it was within um, the bounds of that clearing and grading limit line. The new deck, as it's being proposed, is really encroaching on that clearing and grading limit line, but there may be an opportunity to reduce that, oh, that, that encroachment by reorienting, maybe doing one staircase instead of a, a master staircase. I, you know, I, I don't want to plan it for the applicant, but there is a way to try and reduce the uh, encroachment into the clearing and grading. Okay, thank you. Bob, you had some comments? Uh, yes. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Yeah, just, um, you know, basically on what I reviewed based on the site plan, the wetland survey, the architectural plan, um, the applicant constructed several improvements without a VP over the years, 
not only in the clear and the grading, but the 70 foot buffer area, which was implemented many years ago to keep that pristine from the adjacent property owners outside the subdivision and some portions within a wetlands buffer, such as the basketball court, stone curb, concrete block retaining wall, concrete block walkway, steps, portions of the wood deck, landing and stairs, which is uh, halfway constructed right now anyway. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, I was had a look at several plans going back and forth, back and forth, very confusing sometimes. And I think the planning board should decide as to whether the submitted plans should be put on one plan as opposed to looking at four or five different plans to figure out what's going on. Uh, the planning board always likes to see, in most cases, an integrated plot plan where you have one professional consultant implement all of these things on one plan to look at. And I think it's very good to memorialize it, to review it in the future as well. So uh, that's what I'd recommend to the board, that the three consultants and the one concise set of plans prepared and signed I would think in this case, it would be a registered landscape architect to take the lead. Uh, that's number two. Uh, number three, I just put many different types of things that are not shown on the site plan, which should be shown on the site plan, which would make everyone's life easier when someone tries to figure out what was done 10 years from now, when they're trying to figure out what additional items may have been done or not done, A through G. Um, number four, the subject property is obviously located in the DEP territory and it looks like to me they're going to disturb more than 5,000 square feet, which is going to need an NOI from the state just for erosion and sedimentation controls. And also to, again, to my point on number two, it's unclear as to whether the applicant is proposing to amend the previously approved clear integrated line. At this time, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I think they should do a better job of showing it on the next plan if they do have an IPP. Uh, and if the planning board is inclined to approve the amended clearing grading, that's requested that the applicant should submit the declaration regarding that to be reviewed by town council. And also, too, I, it's unclear as to how the wetlands flagging and associated wetlands buffer was incorporated onto the sketches. Um, typical fashion, these must be field located and flagged by a scientist and then survey located and put on by AutoCAD. I'm not quite sure how this was done. Maybe the applicant can explain how this was done. And those are my comments, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yeah, I, I, uh, to, to Bob's point, it, I, I, I heard, them, mm -hmm. and uh, they're all things we can address. Good. Okay. It's not, a, not, it's not a problem. Good. But I did say, though, uh, prior that uh, we had engaged a surveyor. To lo you know, locate the flag. That's um, right. We just didn't have the, yep. the turnaround time. Got it. But okay. As far as those other other items, I, I'm sure we can address in the block and comments about water service. Yep. And, and, uh, and sewer service. We'll put those on. That, that's up to you. Great. Uh, if I might, I'd like to address some of Sabrina's comments. Um, well, uh, let me take Dennis's now. And, um, oh. If you have questions on them, uh, like, I do. Oh, okay, that, that's fine. We can do that now. Um, you know. um, number one, we have a survey which says the property is 53,840 square feet. Somehow the town thinks it's 54,000. So <laughs> I, I think my survey supersedes. Okay. Um, the, the, the coverage question is interesting. Uh, a, bill, a, a certificate of occupancy was issued for a building that exceeded the the uh, the, uh, the allowable, and I don't know that's what just happened 30 years ago. Uh, I don't know how that happened actually. Yeah. yeah. So I mean I don't know that we can do anything about it. We've got to see so that's the end of that issue as far as I'm Well, uh, it, it's, it's part of the same plan, so that if, if you're over, we may wish to look at some areas that you're restricting. I mean, you're closing, you're getting rid of the basketball court, so yeah. it's going to help. So we'll see what the numbers work out to. Um, okay. It's all part of the equation. It is a site plan we do at this point as well. And then the other thing is that um, the existing deck was 940. The difference between the two decks is 408. 468 square feet. There's no, we're not, there's, there's no discrepancy there. It's just a net difference between what, 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 is, what we're doing and what was there. And that's really it. And the rest of it is 
of development coverage uh-huh. is something we can look at if, if you want to. Yep. Uh, and then that's about it as far as that Okay, goes. good. Dennis, I know you had comments. Hello, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, on the first page, I just, uh, I mean, I, I think they need to apply for a wetlands permit if they're going to be doing work in the wetlands buffer, even even if it's just removal. So that needs to be submitted. Uh, with respect to the seeker form, uh, you have no DEC freshwater wetlands on site, so you could correct that box. Uh, there is no floodplains, 100 or 500 years, you could correct that box. And the first and final bulleted questions on page four, the site development plan application form should be corrected so that no boxes are checked. So that was just administrative complete type stuff. Uh, I did get a chance to go out and uh, good job, Mr. Janning, uh, in that area that resembles the South Asian jungle um, going through the bamboo there. <laughs> uh, I did see his flags. I agree with the, uh, the delineation that I, that I observed. Um, and as depicted, uh, you know, the deck is not within the wetlands buffer. Obviously, most of the, the, the court is. Um, and it just goes over as to, you know, what, what the plan will be in terms of planting and, and, and receding. So I then felt the need to sort of um, just kind of go through the history because if, and the reason I did this is because if I'm tasked with answering the question, is this sufficient mitigation? Does this restore to something? I think that's part of what we sort of need to decide based on, 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 on the history. Uh, so that's the only reason why I went through this exercise, and um, I'm, you know, I'm not sure what what our baseline is. So I think that's something that you know the board may want to consider and discuss, and then that would provide a reference, I think, both to the applicant and myself to to achieve whatever those goals would be. Um, I also feel that although all these projects are now, you know, being proposed at one time and are kind of being conflated and, and mixed, you know, and going through the exercise that, you know, the Corps of Engineers does, because I, I didn't know really what other reference to use to try to illustrate this. Um, I don't see how these projects are connected. They're not, they, they can be completed independent of each other and it looks like they have. So going forward, you know, as the Corps uses the term, they have independent utility. So again, uh, if that's the case, then going back to the prior point about what are we restoring to uh, if restoration is indeed the goal. Mitigation implies that you're compensating for an impact or a loss. So like in, in my mind, I'm having trouble processing because these are like individual columns to me. It's not you know all, all together sort of in the same uh, ball pit. So I just tried to make an attempt uh, both for the applicant and if it was useful for the board, sort of to just, you know, finish the memo with these five bullet points as to, you know, what exactly the ask is and then what exactly we're, we're going to do to try to, you know, remedy, ameliorate, restore, mitigate, whatever words you want to use. So I'm, that's what I'm not clear on at this point based on, you know, what I've had the opportunity to review. Yes, I had a question for you. And you enclosed with your report a copy of uh, the survey that was conducted back, I think, in 1993. And this is what I was alluding to before. It appears to me that because it was a conservation development, that there was a, I don't know, 70 foot buffer between the road and inside. Um, and I don't think that that has been respected over the years. In some areas, it's substantial. it seems to be substantially less than 70 feet. But that was something that I think should be on the IPP that we can take a look at. Um, in addition to clearing grading limit line, uh, this survey suggests that there was a, a buffer zone, which is not unusual for a conservation development. And and um, I don't, it's not on, on the, the sketches. And I, I think that to your point, in terms of finding out what to do here, I think that's important to Put in the mix. See yeah. Which I think is, is very typical for the random farms uh, development. Um, yeah, that would be dispositive in some way for what we're. Yeah. Me too. 
Yeah, could be. Yeah, could be. I think it can help us, you know, in just understanding all of this. I, I think it would be, again, to Bob Scioli's point, having all these lines on, mm -hmm. on a single land would, would be helpful. Clearing grade limit lines, prefer, uh, uh, proposed change in clearing grade limit lines, uh, whatever buffers, wetland buffers, etc. So uh, it would be helpful um, if we, we, we saw these all together on, on a single sketch. So um, it seems to me, unless something has happened since, uh, that's that's a buffer zone that we have to uh, consider as, as we look at this application. So um, other than that, I guess what we'll do is just leave it to the applicant to, um, you know, uh, respond to these these issues and then come back with uh, updated information. Sure. Yeah. Well, Sabrina's here. Uh, I, um, I don't know very much about what the easement, the conservation easement, actually constitutes. Uh -huh. uh, I ask. I don't know if it's an easement. I think it, it's just a buffer. I don't know if yeah. it's a legal easement. And, and I, uh, I asked uh, Wallace to contact Sabrina with re regard to random farms. What? Probably Harold Campbell did the survey. He did. Uh, yeah. Who else? And he can't do them anymore. And that's unfortunate. But I, I there must be a map. That, that uh, were random farms in the files that shows these conservation easements and, and, and has the verbiage. Earl doesn't have anything in his record. So I'd ask uh, Wallace to uh, uh, contact Sabrina. I don't know if it was today or you. He, he did, and I, and, I, and, and, and there was something was, around. You have to go to a file and, and, and get a foil. Is, is, is that my a request would have to come a request would have to be submitted to yeah, us to search the records. Is it, is it going to take For, it's available publicly available online in the Westchester County clerk's records I, I was reviewing the, the subdivision plot this morning um the subdivision plot for random farms is um if you search the Westchester County clerk's website it's filed map 22276 yeah Oh, and the, the 70 foot buffer is, is clearly shown on that subdivision does plot filed in the county clerk's office. There have, you go. And it was also shown in all the site plans that were approved for each for each lot that came but, in before the planning but, board. But you don't have any great town hall, though, is what I'm asking, that someone could just come in and look at. Uh, that, that's why Wallace had, had contacted yeah. to see if that was. Yeah, we, we would have to we would have to pull them. Which okay. would take some time. You'd be better off going online to the Westchester County Clerk's Office, as Jen said, um, yeah. and looking at the map. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, that's it. I mean, we wanted to see what. As far as I understand, the the delineation is shown on every drawing that I've seen so far. So that's not an issue. We know it's seventy feet. What we want to know is what it says. You know, what is the what does it say about what's to happen with that property? With that delineation. Did you look at the building permit? I think it's pretty clear. Maintain conformance with all grading clear and limit lines and wetland restriction lines. Yeah, so we did that. So talking about different lines, talking about conservation. And you should probably obtain a copy of the um the town board resolution for the the um 280A open development area that was associated with the approval of the subdivision and then also the planning boards. Resolution that might give you some more information. All right. Could you give me that number again? The map? Yeah, it's 22276. Okay, that's a map, huh? Very impressive. Okay. All right, that, that, should, that should explain that part of it. But will it be just a drawing or will it be a, a, a paragraph or two about what is supposed to happen in that? Um, it's the filed subdivision plat. I don't. I don't think I saw any notes associated with the 70 foot buffer, but I, I didn't comb through it with, with that level of detail. Um, but that's that's the applicable filed map. And then that, in addition to the resolutions that were adopted at the time, should give you some information. I think that's what I'm trying to get at is we all agree that there's a, a buffer zone. But the question is, do you understand what is supposed to happen in the buffer zone? So that we need to know what that is. I think the answer is nothing. I think the answer is nothing is supposed to happen within the buffer zone. Ah, that's that's, that's, that's an answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's normally what happens in yeah. <laughs> <Another> question. <laughs> yeah, sure, please. I'm just curious. What's
what's the status of the deck right now? It's, well, it's, it's I, in construction. Can I answer that, this question? Sure, Mr. Yes. Great, sure. Right. The deck was built when we moved, we built the house 30 years ago. And I, and I hate to bring up the builder who did this, was Burton Garrett, and they went out of business while building the house. So the CFO was a challenge in getting in the first place. The deck was put up haphazardly by someone else, and it, I don't, whether it conformed or didn't conform, I didn't uh, know. I was 30 years old at the time. So I was barely understanding what a mortgage was, much less easements and buffer zones and all the above. That said, the deck was falling apart to the point where it was dangerous for people to even step on it from coming from the. So I had to. The deck had to come down mm -hmm. because people were literally stepping in and could step through and down. And the deck is 15 feet to the to the ground. So they took the deck down. I did not understand. All I thought I was doing was replacing the deck so it would be safe. Right now, we have yellow tape across the, the uh, windows, which is extraordinarily dangerous. There is nothing that prevents someone from opening the screen door and walking out and falling down 15 feet, literally. The deck has been trying, we've been, so all I was trying to do was put the deck back up so that it could be safe and to make it into a, something that was rectangle rather than this eyeball shape, which made no sense. That's it. But right now, we have nothing. We have the frame up. And we've got a couple of pieces of plywood, but a stop order, a stop work order was put out in February. It's now the middle of the end of June, and it doesn't sound to me like this process is move, is 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 going to be accelerated per se. I do agree with you that these are perhaps two separate things. One is the deck, and one is the the buffer zone, and us removing the basketball court and restoring it back to whatever. The other thing that Paul said, which is very true, is that buffer zone that you refer to was made up of all old, tall, 100-foot white pine trees. Mother Nature took those out, right? Between hurricanes, storms, tornado, what have you. And I replaced, back to his point, at a pretty penny to myself, all of the, the, the vegetation that you see, all of the trees that you see that are put there came by me. I put those in. So I put them into, quote, the buffer zone so that it would have something. Otherwise, it would literally be just grass or just dirt and no grass, no nothing, not because I took down the buffer zone. Mother Nature took down the buffer zone over 30 years. And so what has been replaced by that are all the things that I put in so that there would be something. And there's a lot of vegetation we put up. We spent a lot of money to do that so that there would be some buffer between Hog Hill Road and the, the property, and those trees have grown up to be, so they look like they've been there forever, right? They're 30, 40, 50 feet tall, but when they were put in, they're eight feet tall. So right now, the problem we have on the deck, which is a great question, is we have a, a, a safety issue, a huge safety issue, which we can't do anything. Fortunately, I don't have young kids, but if I did, it would be a problem. And, and we've got wood laid out, nothing has been touched. Things have been covered, nothing has been touched, but it is a real problem. And I would really ask the, the, the board to consider these as separate things so I don't have to have the family at risk with walking out on the deck or walking underneath the deck and something falling upon it. Someone's I, 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 I get it. I, I, I understand the dilemma here. I, I never really understand why it takes so long for the town to do things. And I know that we're sort of maybe part of that problem. Uh, but um, in this particular case, it's like a previous application. Is there any way to sort of separate these two things and allow the construction of the deck to go forward? Yep. And An the emergency resolve is to, to resolve the you know the other issues mm -hmm. as a separate matter. Uh, for, for some reason, the previous application, we were reluctant to do that yet because uh, we need more information. But in this case, I, uh, Jennifer, Sabrina, what can we do here? Anything? I, I, you know, I, I think it's a matter of that, you know, the deck, the way it was previously built was built in the shape that it was built due to the conservation subdivision and respecting the clearing and grading limit line. I don't, unless the applicant wants to restore the deck to what it was previously, then I think that, you know, 
there may be a way, you know, to to expedite the expedite the process, but they have a new design and a new encroachment that's affecting the process. I I, I understand that. I guess I mean I understand that. Um, I guess I what I I guess what I don't understand is why all of these other issues affect that one particular encroachment, and whether we can't deal with that. I'm not suggesting that we don't deal with it. I'm just suggesting we deal with it as an independent matter, and then the numbers that are associated with that get folded into the next part of this application, um, and we deal with that with that there. I'm looking at the drawing. And there's something about this conservation line that I'm not quite sure I understand completely yet. We don't, I don't think we have the information on that, but I'm looking at the, at the encroachment and to me in the context of the entire property and what this gentleman is, is doing uh, with the uh, removing the basketball court and the other things that he's doing, it seems to me that it's, it's should not be something that we would normally be raising red flags on. So I guess I'm just, again, I get, I think we all get frustrated with this, the necessary process that somehow sometimes just doesn't seem to serve anybody really, but the process itself. So I just wonder if there's some way we can get around that in this case. Well, is there also so, perhaps a, a change in the design? How much is the encroachment? Uh, it's the stairs that come down that are encroaching. Is that my understanding? It's 144 square feet. Okay. And is that? Is it really the stairs chiefly that are approaching? No. So if you look at the the building, the design is basically a rectangle. Right. Take two little clip little two corners off of it. Each one of them is a little right triangle. Between the two is hundred and the stairs are hundred and forty feet square. That is in the, that is not in the setback, it's in the approach. So now here's the issue. This is what came up at the first meeting I had with this group is that we went all through it and we discussed it, all of what you just said, Tom, and the final de decision was, well, let's have the planning board decide. And so here we are <laughs> trying to decide and nobody wants to decide. And so nobody I can decide um, well, for some reason or not. No, I think we want to decide. I, I never be told that we can do it. <laughs> it's a difficult thing to do. So um, I, Bob, maybe the sense of your question was, if, if, there's another design for the stair, it might greatly um, advance this right. so in other desire words, to get in, the deck. Okay, so in other words, what you're saying is that that this, the encroachment is really the issue as far as you're concerned. I, for me, it's not an, enough of an encroachment. For me, it's not. Okay, but, well then, but, let's but, go from there. But it's, really, it's wrapped into this application, so that's the problem. Yeah, so that's the point, can't we separate it out? Well, apparently, uh, apparently not. But perhaps if, if through a design change, we can, and then we can get this approved. But can I, can I ask? Sure. So the, the encroachment is 144 square feet. Um, were there to be a design change, that would be one thing to, to either lessen or, or eliminate the encroachment. That's one thing. But let's assume there isn't a design change. There is sort of mitigation being offered here, right? Uh, significantly larger than 144 square feet. As much as I hate to see a basketball court being ripped up, I play basketball, I love it, it looks very nice. Um, I understand, um, and, and it's, it's sort of a, uh, sort of a, it's, is it, what, it should be significantly larger than 144 square feet. Right? What, that basketball court? Yeah. 1600 square feet. Right, so, um, <clears throat> is there, and it seems like most of the conversation we've had so far on this on this matter is more about, and it, and these things matter, but but the the purpose of the conservation setback and the and 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 having the clearing and grading limit lines being on, on the drawing, they all yep. should be. It, that all makes sense, but the question is, uh, to the substance here, are we do we have an issue with the substance? No, the the, yeah. the, the irony is. These things matter when they matter, right? But in this case, they don't matter. <laughs> right? To me, anyway, it's under forty-four square feet, and somehow, but somehow, we're trapped by. And I just isn't there a way that we can, you know, find a way to, as uh, the requested, to separate these two things? And I haven't yet. Maybe I haven't been listening, but I haven't yet heard a a specific no for what particular reason. But but. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but, but do we even need to separate? Because 
Yeah. This is this is only an informal appearance before the board. This isn't even a hearing. And in the previous two applications, what we said was subject to X, Y, and Z, we can be supportive of something here, assuming that they A get something to us in time and B, it is satisfactory to whatever standard or threshold that we're considering satisfactory. And so could we not do something similar here? Well, I think part of the problem is yeah, that I, uh, I'm, can sorry, I, Jennifer. I'm sorry, Tom, did you want to finish and then I can interject? What you have to say is much more intelligent than what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but um, no, I think that LDAD is, is, you know, hitting the nail right on the head here. I think if you're able to convey to the applicant what, if anything, that you're looking for, aside from putting, you know, the appropriate lines on one plan and all of that, um, substantively, what are you looking for from the applicant in order to move this forward? Then you can schedule your public hearing for whether it be July 18th or, or your, you know, the next meeting after that, um, depending upon what needs to be submitted direct a resolution, and presumably this could all be done at the next meeting. But I think the question is, and this is sort of raised in Dennis's memo, is with respect to the wetland permit that's required when the disturbance to the buffer occurs from the removal of the, um, the basketball court, what if any mitigation or restoration efforts are you looking for from the applicant? So beyond anything that's that's already been proposed. Has it Paul already suggested the, the suggested the, what he wants to do in terms of mitigating it? Isn't that on the table? I, I believe it is. And I guess think qu the question to the board is, is that satisfactory? Or are you looking for something more or different? Well, I, I don't know how, frankly, we can draw up a resolution when we don't have that information. It's, it's one thing to, there are a couple of things that have to be I's dotted and T's crossed and Bob's satisfied with those things. We don't even have the application in. Uh, not that this is going to be an earth shattering uh, application, but uh, there are certain things that um, I'd love to help you out. I mean, I, I wish there was just some sort of emergency repair provision that you could just get this, it's a repair. I mean, the thing's gone. It's, it's you're, you're you're not reconstructing it. You're it's it's you're replacing it as a repair. Um, and absent that, I don't. Uh, uh, unfortunately, all this stuff gets snared in there. I, I'd I'd love to be able if if you could get all that stuff to us in six days, we'd schedule for July 18th. What Bob is talking about, the things that Bob is talking about, is what we need to update and get going. Correct. Well, both Bob and Sabrina and, yeah, right, and Dennis. Right, right. But okay, so presumably we do that. That has to do with the site and the environmental part of it. If that's all done, then it is your decision whether you're going to go along with all of that as being okay and then discuss the 144 square feet. I think and the, so the 144 will be about the eight eight sec I think the 144 will be about eight seconds. Yeah, we don't have a problem with it. Okay. Well, unfortunately, it's 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 we're all we're tied up. We're okay. sort of so in other words, you're telling me that you don't have a problem with 144 square feet. I don't. So I don't think have, right. does. I don't think Tom does. Well, uh, uh, Dick does. Uh, uh, so I don't have to change the plans. Well, wait, well, wait, 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 well, wait, wait, wait a second. Uh, with regard to the location of things, the, the improvements you're talking about, from my perspective, you don't. But yeah. you need to get the plans to be comprehensive plans of all of the lines that apply. <laughs> You need to get that drawing in place so that we know where all that is. And that's actually not on us. Yeah, that's on you and your team. That's your job. We're not holding you up. You are holding us up by not having all that information in. And if you guys can get it in, I think that we can for you. Mr. Chairman, can I say one thing? Absolutely. Um, just, just for the record, uh, based on the survey, the steps do require a variance from the zoning board because the survey shows it 57 feet as opposed to 60 feet. So it would need a three foot variance from the zoning board just for your information. For what, the where the steps come out? Yes, sir. So again, if you can design it somehow where the steps don't come out by three feet, I mean, well, well, save you yourself that. Again, I thought the setback was 60 feet. And the That's 60 feet, and, you have, and the survey shows 57 feet to the steps. So. 
That's a three foot oh, variance, right? Sorry, okay, okay. Maybe you can yeah. turn the steps. Yeah. And you'll be all set. Um, we're a friendly obstructionist. <laughs> okay. So, so again, if, if, if you can, you know, we're loading up July 18th potentially, but if, if you guys can get, if the team can get this stuff in, turn it in. We'd love to help you. Street to the steps going down? No, the, the, the stairs, the setback. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I think there's a lot of for you to do, Paul. But without further ado, yes, yeah, I'll be the same. Yeah. <laughs> time is is clicking away here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 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 Good. So we'll see you as, as soon as possible. Yeah. We, uh, Jennifer, does this? How, how can we schedule a public hearing when we don't have the application? It can be subject to receiving the application. Um, so as long as we have the application in by the time that you know it, it needs to be noticed by and, and staff can review it. Um, okay. If not, then the public hearing won't be scheduled and won't be open. So we can uh, have a motion to schedule a public hearing on this application for July 18th, obviously subject to receipt of the material. Okay. The question is, what is the deadline for that? Six days. For the next uh, submission. It's on the night, the news on the 19th. 18th. June 26th. June 26th. Okay, June 26th. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so who's going to make the motion? Oh, that's right. <laughs> we need a motion. Um, a motion. Dick, do you want to second it? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Three and then one is uh, not here right now. Okay, uh, the next item is a discussion item on the uh, North Greeley Zero legislation, 50 North Greeley. Um, my intention on this was to really turn it over to Tom and Elda. You guys can, you're the only ones who received the color plot, by the way. Uh, if you guys can bring us up to speed in terms of uh, what's going on, next steps, and all that kind of good stuff. You guys, Elda, you're up. Sure, so I'll, I'll, I'll do the the best I can, and, and then Tom, I'm sure, will come in and uh, correct me. Um, but so we had a, a working group meeting. Um, here's Tom. Tom, I need you. I don't remember any of the details. What are you talking about? The working group meeting that we had. <laughs> um, so we had the working group meeting uh, a few weeks ago, um, and um, it was a very, I think, uh, positive and successful session. We had uh, two representatives from the town board, two representatives from the planning board, and for the first time, we had two representatives from the architectural review board, which was uh, interesting and helpful. Um, and and I, I think Tom, you, you also found it helpful to hear, hear their, their point of view. Um, we discussed uh, the memo that the planning board sent to the town board with regards to the 50 North Greeley application, uh, specifically, um, we spent a good amount of time talking about our concerns about the ground floor, urban design uh, principles, the planning principles associated with street life and street activity, and that piece of it. Um, there was, I believe, a, a, an understanding and a willingness. Uh, the applicant was there also. Um, as as were members of the public um, uh, and the architect, um, I, there was willing and an understanding and willingness on the side of the applicant to um, address some of the concerns about the ground floor. Specifically, uh, one of the biggest issues that Tom raised that, and and that I thought was a really important one was the the siting of the bicycle parking created uh, a significant uh, width or length of, uh, of sort of dead wall space at the ground level. Um, and uh, Tom can fill in the details, but, what, but the way the meeting ended is that they pledged to come back to us with some revised designs. Um, and I believe what we got before us is, is just that, uh, their attempt I haven't reviewed it uh, all that closely yet, but uh, their attempt to, to make some changes. The other piece 
uh, that was interesting that was new to me on the night out of the working group is that there is a sewer easement on the north portion of the site that cuts off sort of the, the tip of the site. And uh, if you recall, there was you know four buildings, uh, essentially four building segments. Um, and, and this uh, sewer easement um, created a, an issue with the northernmost um, building segment um, in and of itself limiting the it seeming seemingly limiting the number of units residential units that could be built on the site because that fourth building segment uh, I think essentially goes away um, so uh, there was some it looks like there's a reconfiguration to uh, the the northernmost portion of the site as well as some of the street frontage issues um, Tom how did I do uh, great except for the fact I disagree with you <laughs> about whether the meeting went well. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that's fair. Yeah, that's what we well, had. That part was, um, was, was, uh, was opinion, not, not uh, fact. Fair enough. Uh, I mean, that's why we have a five-member board. Um, so I don't think it went well at all. My, my, my um, feeling is that, and uh, I think that we have, uh, this board has a, a record on this subject of suggesting that this process somehow is backwards in its um, in the initiative and the way it came forward. I understand that this is the way these things often happen: is a developer comes in for a special permit, uh, but uh, that there has been missing the public the, the <coughs> public interest in what this site could be and what it means to North uh, Greeley. Uh, and focused instead on what the um, the uh, developer and the property owner uh, are doing and negotiating from that position. And uh, it, the, our list of things, <clears throat> excuse me, our list of things that we thought needed to be addressed in the memos in the, that we've been sending over to the town board is a relatively, it's not that long, but it's, it's, significant in terms of the implications for the development of the site. And it seems to me that unless I'm missing something, really nothing, none of those things have been addressed with the exception of what happened in the last working group meeting, which was to say, okay, we'll put some retail on the ground floor and we'll make the, the, the bike rack go away. Um, that's never going to get us there. Now, I don't think it's going to get us there for where I think we need to go. And so one of the things that I think that we've been thinking about is that we really need to get at the, at the design itself, at the proposal itself, something we haven't done. And that maybe what, what's missing here in our contribution is memos just aren't doing the trick. I mean, we, it's, it's, they seem to go into, some, into the, the, the ether and we don't really see much coming back out of our contribution in terms of real discussion uh, among the town board and the applicant uh, to address those things and see if uh, those things can be can be uh, dealt with. So we thought the next thing to do would be actually put some put some pictures to our words. In other words, let's see what an alternative would look like that responds to that is a, the, the a demonstration of the planning things that we thought ought to happen for the benefit of the town. So that's what I've been doing for the last couple of weeks. And again, I just have to say, this you're going to see some designs. These are not designs for a building. They're going to look like designs for a building. They're not designs for a building. They are just a demonstration of what the planning principles that we recommend for the site what they would deliver, what they would yield if somebody were to design a building. You could design, you get 10 different architects with those principles, and you are likely to get seven different designs that honor those principles. So nobody should go away thinking that the planning board's trying to design this thing. We're not. We're just trying to make make an illustration of what we think um, the planning principles ought to be. There's, there's a site. Next. Uh, one of the things, uh, I'm sorry, next one. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting about the site is that it's the frontage of the site of North Greeley. 
is equal to the frontage of the site uh, of the, the combined sites in South Greeley from the corner all the way to the bank building there. So this is a significant contribution to the to the town. This isn't just a site. This is actually building one quarter. If you count the two sides of South Greeley and the two sides of North Greeley, this is really building one quarter, 25% essentially, of the frontage for the center of our hamlet. Next. Sorry, next. Now, one of the, the, the proposal here is, is to have these four different pavilions and with them being actually raised on a concrete platform. And it, it's my feeling that this is not uh, an architecture or an urban design that really says anything about us. It, it's not something we would recognize as being part of Chappaqua. Next. So our concerns about the site, about the design, are the, the basic principle here is what we want to do is we think that this frontage ought to be um, an active frontage, that it would be uh, not only a potential space for retail, but the way to activate, activate the uh, North Greeley is to have a set of uses, and this is in the memo we sent, have a set of uses that are uh, residential uses that are retail uses that are um, uh, building lobbies that are the kinds of things that people actually go into and out of the building wall and in this in their design of the of the frontage there is retail here but from here to here is about 165 feet there's a bicycle storage rack and there's a parking garage in here and that this is going to be just it's going to be dead space. The, the objective should be to get people to walk up and down North Greeley in order to activate it, in order to actually add some property value to the streets to the properties across the street. In addition to that, in that frustrates this movement is the fact that the building lobby is back here. So that people who are coming from the train station who are going into the center of the hamlet are actually coming up the alley and going into the lobby to get to the core, the elevator core, which is over here. So all of this traffic, the foot traffic of, I guess it's 100 people, whatever it would be for 45 units, all the foot traffic is actually making a turn and going up the alley instead of making a contribution to the street. Who would have to stay open to the public meeting? The, there is provision here for public, they're calling these public courts, and if you if you look at the at the images, we'll see them in a second. These public courts really are not conducive to people coming and say, say, staying in the public space. So let's go to the next slide. And then these are the I'm sure you guys have seen you've seen the, the drawings before, but these are the residential bars that are essentially those buildings that sit on top of the concrete podium here. And then these are open spaces that are uh, courtyards that are reserved for the residents who would live here. Next. So this is a sketch that shows another way to think about this. And instead of, it, it, instead of essentially ignoring the frontage of North Greeley, this one puts active uses on, the, on North Greeley. And what you have in this scheme is the diner at the corner with it, with retail at the corner, building lobby here off of North Greeley, drawing people into the building. One, two, three, four residential units with entrances into those units, those apartments, and a second lobby over here with, uh, for that end of the building with an office space here. So these are all active uses along the frontage of the building. The other thing it does is that instead of bringing the parking garage, the, the traffic to the parking garage off of North Greeley, this one uses the alley over here to get into the parking garage. This is the alley for the driveway for what the driveway is intended to do. The implication here is that what you could do is you could go to the adjacent property owner and actually come up with an easement where it would be a shared driveway 
where you'd have 12 feet or 15 feet or 13 feet, whatever it might be on one side of the, of, of the property line, 13 feet on the other side of the property line, so you can get two-way traffic into the, into the parking areas, one on the left and the other under the building here. There is a, we've been listening also to uh, uh, the residents about certain things that just don't seem to work very well, and also to the fire chief. And one of the things about the bike storage is not only its, in its location on the frontage, but also that there is a potential, if these are e-bikes, there's a potential for a real fire hazard there. And it's probably a good idea to put bike storage not underneath that building or in that building, but in a separate structure somewhere. And this is, that's what this is over here. And if this is uh, the diner in the corner here, the diner is going to need some the diner is going to need some uh, a place to uh, have its uh, organic waste. So this would be the service alley to get to a trash area here. The service alley also would take you to a uh, dedicated parking space for deliveries. So the Amazon trucks and and um, and the uh, those special deliveries would have a place to to, to get to off of the street um, and out of the way of traffic. So what this this does is that this is open parking here. This is open to the sky. In the pre, in their in their uh, proposal, could you go back? This is entirely concrete. Concrete deck is this much of this building, and everything sits on top of that. And so the building coverage is is, um, I don't know what the percentage is, but go forward. In this scheme, the building edge is here, and then here, and all of this is open to the sky. So not only do you have less coverage, you also have, I don't know how many square feet of concrete structure that you don't have to build, which is something that if you're if you're doing the, the net carbon zero thing, the biggest uh, uh, problem is concrete. Uh, here's an opportunity to do um, to do much less of that. Next, the second floor. These are bedroom units again that go along the street frontage. In this wing, there are four bedroom units over here. On the second floor, there would also be provision for workspaces for people to either have part of, of their of their lease or rent on a uh, on, on a temporary basis. Um, one of the provisions in the in the plans, if you look at their unit plans, is for um, workspaces inside the apartments, and that really, my experience is, and from people I talk to. That's not something that really works very well because of the competition for space and the distractions and noise. <clears throat> and being able to provide that kind of a space, separate space in the in the in the uh, in the building, uh, we think would be an asset to the community. Next, and then the next floor is just a typical floor, and one more. And this is the fourth floor, and the fourth floor that piece to the left drops out because of the lower scale elevations of um, the uh, center of the hamlet, people are concerned about this building encroaching and it's height too close to that. Next. So this, that's in a nutshell, an organization of the, um, of the program, which yields, I think, everything one would want in the program in locations where it's appropriate uh, to begin to build a neighborhood street. Um, however, it yields not 45 units, which are being proposed, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 33, 32, 33, with 45 parking spaces. Now, what that does is that it gives us a better parking ratio, if we're concerned about parking ratios. Um, it gives us a, an opportunity to begin to think about, well, maybe we can actually begin to park um, some of the retail traffic in here, although it's pretty unlikely, I think, that anybody going to the diner is going to park behind this building. So we ought to be thinking about if there's a parking resource here, that maybe the parking resource ought to be uh, credited to the residential 
in order because there are some people who have made the argument that you really can't expect that people who are living out in the suburbs here are only going to have one car. That there is probably the going to be the the consequence of people living out here where there uh, many of them are going to need two cars and providing one per one per apartment is not going to not going to do it. Next. And here's an elevation that's from their presentation, which shows a height limit of, I think it's 50 feet, 4 feet, 57 feet, I forget, of uh, the top of the building. <clears throat> now that height is driven above the 45 feet, which would be the roof height, the standard roof height of, of the construction of the building, um, is driven by the roof geometry that they're putting on top of the building. The argument there is that they want to do that to essentially hide any Mechanical systems might be up there, penthouse uh, units might be up there. I'm not sure that that's really a consideration. I don't think that that's really a, an eyesore in town. If you are walking down the street, you don't see those things because they're far enough back in the roof. And it's really not, uh, uh, I think it's really not a problem. Next. So one of the things that, that I think is a little bit, that uh, needs to be looked at is the massing of the building in relation to the street. And if you, this now this is not their drawing, this is my drawing, so I need to be sure that the, the credits are on this before it goes out to anybody. This is not their drawing. But it's my best re rendition of taking their drawings and make it into a three-dimensional uh, object in the computer where it can be, you can move it around and get a better view of what's going on. And if you look at the building overhangs here, and that building setback where the court is above and the shape of the roof and the depth of that, it just doesn't feel like Chappaqua to me. It just doesn't feel like a Hamlet environment to me. It doesn't feel like it's something with, that we want to necessarily build a neighborhood on. This is the area where they would be proposed to put a, um, proposed to put the, uh, the sidewalk uh, tables for uh, the diner and that area is going to be in probably from, I'm guessing from, I have to look at the shadow studies again, but from um, maybe um, September, October on is going to be in the shade from the uh, building above it. Next. And you can see a repetition of this form where the building blocks hover above the street and then the organization of the street wall seems to be a random pattern of openings and glass and, and sort of something that fell out of the consequence of a design decision rather than the intention of building a street that is a neighborhood street. Next. And the courtyards themselves, they are being talked about as an amenity. Well, I think one needs to decide whether it, these are amenities that, as a benefit, I, I don't think that these are going to be benefiting the town because they're private spaces. But the other aspect of it, if you look at this, this image in particular, this is 42 feet, I think, the gentleman said, 43 feet, Mr. Davis said. And this is a 30 foot high wall here. And if you just look at the relationship between these windows facing each other and the scale of someone in this space and the depth of the space, it doesn't seem to me that this is the kind of uh, living environment, living condition that we need to be building here in our town. It's, it's much more urban than we would propose, I think, if we had our druthers, and we do. That these, these windows ought to be facing the street or they ought to be facing public spaces rather than facing each other in such a constrained environment. Now, it's a constrained space. Now, I, I know why it's done. I know it's done this way in order to create the maximum amount of perimeter area in order to locate the maximum number of units because every unit needs daylight, and that's the way you do it, is you maximize your perimeter. And this is the consequence of that objective on this particular site. To me, if I'm living there, the first thing I'm going to do in the morning is close my blinds, 
and the next thing, and they're going to stay closed until you know I go to bed at night because these windows are literally facing each other. Within this is this is a little over thirty feet, and imagine three story building. 10, uh, 30 feet high with residential windows, and I think that space is about 80 or 90 feet deep. It just, it, it's not the kind of environment I think we ought to be building here, and I don't think we have to be building here. Next. So, there's this other thing about, about green roofs, and I'm not, I mean, I, the green roofs are great, but I'm just not entirely certain that <clears throat> a green roof has the kind of longevity that we had hoped it would. It would. The um, I, I I also think that one therefore one day it may be true that these roofs will have to be replaced with something else and what would that be and maybe we ought to think about them as another roof in order to be sure we we understand what the consequences are. <clears throat> There's also been the suggestion that that um, there ought to be solar on the project and um, Mr. Davis said that they could they could do that. I think um, their architect said that. But trying to put solar panels on a triangular <coughs> roof um, just never works out uh, very well aesthetically. Uh, I just don't think there's a good solution for that in the long term. Next. So here we have these four buildings, and there may end up being three, but individual pavilion buildings that hover over the street, and you can see the scale of them, and that their shape and their size and their location really call attention to themselves. And there's this basic principle in town planning that there really is a purposeful difference between what's known as background buildings and object buildings. <coughs> background buildings are the buildings that form the public spaces, the streets and public plazas um, that help shape that public space. Object buildings are the important ones that we celebrate, like the town hall, library, um, churches, and they, those are the ones that take special prominence in their design and should, because they are objects of uh, public pride often, and objects of civic identity. Here we have, I think, buildings which are designed as object buildings and really don't serve the purpose of being a background building are going, and are going to call attention to themselves. Next. And you can see in their model the scale of these buildings and the way in which they announce themselves as being separate from the hamlet rather than being part of the hamlet. Next. And there's a there's a tradition for this. This is a, I see this as a as an extension of what is called brutalism, which is a a particular strain of um, modern architecture, modernist architecture which has been around for quite a while. And these are some examples. You'll see the one here you may be familiar with, which is Marcel Breuer's uh, Whitney. But these are buildings which are designed specifically to call attention to themselves, specifically to make an announcement of what they are and separate themselves from the environment. And they do it in a very aggressive way. They do it by building overhangs, by massive, um, uh, uh, massive street walls, and by making interesting geometries uh, out of themselves. And it seems to me that the architect's intention may not be specifically to follow that, but it looks like it's, it is somehow it's similar to that and it's going to have, I think, the similar consequence. Next. So going back to the plan, this is where it gets really um, sort of stupid pet tricks because now you're going to see some elevations next. This is a proposal for, this is not a proposal, this is a, an image that begin, that is a example of how one might take the principles that we have identified as being the public interest principles that ought to be in the zoning text that a developer then responds to. And you'll recognize the bar here, and you'll recognize this this bar here, which is the, those uh, those twelve apartments that are at a, the the leg of the T that go over the parking lot behind. And here's the surface parking here, 
This here is the um, is the bike storage in this location. Next. And this is the back of the building, just so you can get yourself oriented again. That's that bar I just talked about. Here's here's the, the frontage of the building. There, are, these are the workspaces. There's the bike storage, and there's a surface parking lot entering off of the alley back here. Next. And there's another view from the other side, from the south side. You can see the entrance into the parking here. So all of this is open area here. Next. And this is a shot at what that might look like. And the basic principles here are there's been some comment, a lot of comment, I think, about beware of the long street wall. It's, a, it's something that we ought to try and avoid, that uh, breaking the buildings up into, into three, into different pavilions is a good thing because it avoids a 400 foot long street wall. And I understand that. I mean, I don't disagree with that. But there are plenty of ways to deal with a 400 foot long street wall. Go into any Manhattan block and you can see there are ways to do that in terms of row houses, the identification of each row house being separate from each other. For example, in this particular case, one way to deal with it is to take this um, 400 foot long street wall and break it up into separate building masses so that you begin to break down that wall. And then take each one of those building masses and give it a different articulation to make it look like it's a separate building. Now, you guys, people may not agree with this particular architectural stylistic treatment. That's fine. That's not the point of the drawing. The point of the drawing is to try and elucidate the principles that are involved. Next. So you can see this is, um, we're looking um, over here is where uh, Susan Lawrence is and three separate buildings. They are joined by these elevator towers, but they are set back. So three separate buildings. This one has a diner in it, plus a store. These are three units here, each of which has its own identity by the breakup of the windows and the entrance of the, of the, uh, to the units. Entrance is on the street with stoops going up into it. And then a separate building over here, which is uh, four more units up here. Uh, one, two, three, four. Each of these are each. Each one of these is an apartment at one level. So that's an apartment. That's an apartment. That's an apartment. That's an apartment. But they're grouped and organized in a way that it begins to uh, indicate, implicate that there is a separate uh, building here rather than just a long row of apartments. Next. So you can begin to see how when you be, start to add some detail and some texture to this that it begins to break down and make it all a little bit more humane and makes it something which could be the beginning of an actual neighborhood with a sidewalk and a streetscape leading to neighborhood units with a diner at the corner and then leading also to lobbies off of the street rather than up the alley. Lobbies to the units above. Next. And that's a, a, a close up of those of that center bar. Again, here are the entrances with stoops. And then the implication that these are actually three separate buildings here rather than one long building. The attempt to break it down and humanize it. Next. And the notion of taking the, the seating area and putting it around the corner tucked under an overhanging building, and that's going to be the place where people are going to, and, and on the north side of the building where it's in shade, that seems to me the wrong way to deal with a sidewalk restaurant. It seems to me it wants to be out on the sidewalk, and it wants to be, if it can be, related to the other activity on the street, in particular Susan Lawrence and their sidewalk cafe situation, so that you get a combination of these things reinforcing each other. There's a basic principle in town planning and in park planning that people want to go where people are. And if you begin to congregate people in spaces, find a way to congregate them in, in spaces, it's just going to bring more people to those spaces. So put them in a place where they want to be. And the place where they want to be, I think, is where other people are. And that's the uh, reason why the sidewalk cafe works, I think, better here than around the corner. And having chat the diner as a presence at the corner draws people to that corner. 
and then you borrow on the on that activity by putting a shop next to it, which is that piece right there. Next. And you begin to get a sense of the texture now of what it can feel like if we actually create a neighborhood street here. Next. This is a little bit farther down the way. This is the second lobby here for the, um, the other end of this bar. <coughs> and these spaces here, that bench right there and this space right here, that's the Uber parking space. That's nobody, that's a no parking space essentially. And that's the Uber pickup area. One of the things we need to figure out how to deal with is the curbside because the curbside is gonna be under demand. It's going to be under demand from parking. It's going to be under demand from the fire department. It's going to be under demand from the snow clearing guys. It's going to be under demand for uh, the Uber and Lyft people. So let's begin to think about that and begin to zone these things <coughs> in ways that actually relate to the architecture itself. Next. And that's a close up looking the other way along this neighborhood street. Gary, next. Uh, and that's well, that's redundant. But you can see again, this is the part. This is the driveway taking you up into the parking area, into the parking lot behind. But also, it's a shared driveway for the lot next door. It's also where the delivery vehicles go, and it's also where the uh, garbage and refuse people truck goes. There's no provision for that anywhere that I can see in the plan that's being proposed right now. Instead, what they have is the entrance for the lobby, and they are pitching it as a linear park. And I just can't understand why anybody would want to go and, and sit in next to that building, any building, facing a parking lot back up that. Then nobody's going to go there. It's just, it's just not going to happen. So I'm not. It's hard to justify that base of the building being used that way because it just. I don't think it will work next. Now, three stories. So the, what you saw before is a four-story scheme. This is a three-story scheme. And it's the same in every respect except the, for the top story. Next. Just to get a feeling for um, what that might be. And we probably should put the two next to each other. Next. And uh, it is um, clearly more sort of Hamlet-like than it is town-like, I think. Next. These are beginning to feel like more like personal sort of environments, homes uh, on the street. Next. No, well, that's just the same thing with shadows. Next. And again, it's essentially the same views, but with a lower building. And I think that there is a demonstrable, I think, improvement in the scale if we want to be thinking about Hamlet as opposed to town. There's a demonstrable improvement in scale here for that purpose. Next. And again, next. Too many slides here. And that's looking down the sidewalk. Next. Okay. I have to explain this one. So to make sure that we're making the argument that we are not here to design this building, number one, it's not the planning board's job to dictate or to even necessarily weigh in too heavily on architectural style. I did one which is a same building, but with a different architectural treatment. You'll see the elements are essentially the same. It's a building here, a building here, and a building here is the way it's intended to look. But the architectural treatment is more sort of what you would see at Chappaqua Crossing, for example. I think when people think about building in Chappaqua, they would say, this is us. I'm not a fan of this, but I'm not the decider in chief in this. Somebody else is going to be deciding what happens to the facade and the architectural style of the building. Next. But you can begin to see why some people like this, because you, the, the architecture delivers elements like cornices, 
like pilasters, like balconies, porches, uh, lintels, those kinds of things that give human scale and human texture and community texture to architecture. Next. Next. And there's a now you can get there's there's this is an image a closer up image of that same row of three buildings I'm uh, sorry one building but three different facades in the other one these facades are even more different from each other so these look like big townhomes on the street they aren't big townhomes on the street they just look like big townhomes on the street. These are still apartments. That is a one bedroom unit. That's a one bedroom unit. There's another one bedroom unit. You get to these units from the hallway behind. What is the same in this proposal as it is in the, the, the uh, um, architect's pr proposal is that the back of this building facing railroad tracks is one corridor. It's a, just a long corridor. There are, no, there are no units facing the railroad tracks. But the presentation of it is as um, row houses, if you will, in individual buildings. Next. Next. And once you start to put plants in and put trees in, it gets even happier, I guess. I like this, Tom. It's, it's, it actually reminds me of the, uh, that housing, the small housing development when you go into Millwood from Chappaqua. Right. And it has the same kind of feeling there. Well, the, the thing of it is, is we're building the, this kind of thing right now up at Chapel Crossing. They're going to be 91 units. I mean, they're not going to look like this. And I, believe me, uh, Toll Brothers is a lot more skillful at this kind of thing than I am. But we are building more of this, and this is becoming, we are doubling down on the identity of the town as being represented by this kind of architecture. And if that's what people want, then that's fine. I mean, I, it's not for me to say. But there was one comment that I thought was from a young, I think she was a college student at one of the town meetings, which was, she said that, I'm paraphrasing here, but she said, gee, you know, can't we build, it's time to build for us. You guys essentially, you know, you build for yourselves, but we want something new. This is our generation. We want essentially a this is a chance to do a new part of Chapel Hamlet that we can identify with as being part of our generation. I think she was saying that essentially this is not something she would be looking for. And I think she makes a pretty good point. Eldad, when we were doing the form-based code, Eldad had a very, uh, I think, a cogent comment, which was that we really need to be thinking about the people who aren't here yet. And um, the people who aren't here yet are the people of the next generation and the generation after. This speaks to previous generations, which is, is fine if that's what we want to build, but that's one of the arguments for the previous architecture that um, I had shown before. Next. And so there are there's something there's something called urban design, which is the gap between planning and the and architecture, which is how towns actually feel and urban spaces actually feel. And it's a combination of the arrangement of land uses, the location of things, the necessary things like parking, the, um, the scale of the buildings, and also the architecture of the buildings and what, how they contribute to public space. And here I think are, in, in the case of the difference between this building and these two, there is something dramatically different in terms of the massing of the building, the way the ground floor is being used, the way you access uh, certain things, the way you uh, address the building, the way the building, these buildings actually are on the property line. These buildings, four story buildings, which uh, three story uh, pavilions, which loom over the pedestrian space are actually at the property. There's no setback from that as opposed to these two, which have different architectural treatments, but essentially make a street wall which contributes to the sense of a community and takes the 
massing treatment of stepping back, and in some cases is a three-story treatment instead of a four-story treatment, and delivers uh, whatever architecture you choose, the principles of, the ur of urban design, if you put them in place, can yield any version of the, one on, the ones on the left, but still give you, I think, what we ought to be thinking about, which is what does it take to actually make, what do we want to have happen here in North Greeley? And we've been talking about, you know, we ought to be doing a neighborhood here. And what is that, what constitutes a neighborhood? And those principles as applied to these images is one way to look at what that neighborhood would look like. I'd submit that, that this doesn't. And so these guys haven't seen this yet. And this is really a conversation among us. Everybody's welcome, welcome to join in. But the question is, I think, how do we feel about this and what do we do with any of this, if anything? Well, I, th I think it's important to see, um, see something that's uh, more tangible. Um, it's one thing uh, we're, we're always bogged down because we're looking at plans and they're, they're two dimensional. And very often we have to go out and do site visits just to see what's going on. So it's very interesting, I think, to see this and, and uh, the comparison. You know, I'm, I'm not an architecture person, I would never uh, impose my taste on anyone. Um, but I will tell you that you know, we've talked about the certain tenants uh, dealing with planning uh, in, in the hamlet, and, and we've talked, we've written about it, we've talked about it, and these principles are what we see uh, as, as lacking in some cases with the, with the proposal. And um, we don't think it's rocket science, um, but we think activation of that street is, is critical and in a way that is, um, um, uh, I don't want to use the word human, but you know, more, more to scale with, uh, with people, citizens, residents, uh, pedestrians. So um, I love the, these ideas because I think it's, it's, it springs from what we talked about last time in terms of those activation principles. And I think we were all on board with that. Kanan's not here tonight, but she was on board with it as well. She absolutely supported it. And um, it's, it's just you know, somewhat frustrating not to see that uh, other people are not even considering this. Uh, what's frustrating to me is um, this app, this, it's, not, it's, it's a petition, not an application. So the zoning petition really, when you come down to it, is, is no different than many applications we see. Uh, you know, a, a person's got an idea, a concept, which is terrific, um, and, and, and they want to maximize their return, which is their right. But what we often see is um, the proposal includes more activity uh, on a site um, than, than is probably reasonable for the, the, the yield for that site. Um, you can measure it in all different ways. We've, uh, you know, many people, if, it, you know, if you do the, just do the arithmetic, it's, uh, it's, it's 56 units per acre. That is just clearly more of an urban feel and urban density than, than the Chappaqua Hamlet uh, existing uh, density. So that's one way that you can measure it. Um, it's, it's um, to my way of thinking, um, we've been struggling with this. Um, uh, I know some town board members have referred to it as holistic and you know, looking at it together as a, as a whole, the neighborhood. This is the, the launch pad for, uh, for this neighborhood. This is, we're going to leverage the rest of North Greeley off of this site because it's so substantial. So um, we're not trying to make a big deal out of it because it's not a big deal. It is a big deal for North Greeley. It sets the tone. It sets the stage. So to the extent that we're not creating a neighborhood, uh, I mean, I've gone on record. I mean, uh, I, and I think it would help the, uh, the applicant with the parking issue, which I think is still a very important one. As far as I'm concerned, I, I don't see this as a commercial avenue. And if you want to eliminate commercial, that would be fine by me. It's, it's causing the applicant uh, grief in terms of parking. And if I see nothing wrong in making this a residential street with, with uh, multifamily housing. Uh, we have condominiums at the other end of, of North Greeley. We don't have shops down there. That exists down there. It's, it's purely residential. We have residential areas that surround it. It, it is a bedroom community. It, it is a, people come here to live. And I, you know, if someone was able to demonstrate to me that there is a pressing need for additional retail when there are so many vacancies 
in our area, not necessarily Chappaqua Hamlet, but look around, walk through Mount Kisco, walk through Pleasantville, these are our neighbors, lots of vacancies, lots of turnover, people having a hard time uh, sticking it out in retail. So um, is that the correct solution? I don't know, but it's certainly something that should be looked at. And I, I'm just flummoxed that um, an application or a, a petition has been submitted and unlike anything that I'm familiar with, after many years on this board, uh, or many years on ERB before this, it's very unusual to have an, an application that just goes through as is with very, very little refinement. Um, and, uh, you know, this is it. Um, that's not to say that they couldn't hit the, 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 you know, the nail in the head on the first time through. I don't think they have in this case. And, I, you know, I've... I've you know, I have many concerns. I've, I, first of all, you know, um, I, I think other people have mentioned this. You know, uh, I don't know whether to classify the ask as big or whatever, but there is an ask here. And this ask, if approved, has, whether we, you know, want to recognize it or not, has gigantic financial impact to the petitioner. Uh, a four-story zoning on this petition, on this property, adds tremendous wealth, whether he develops this or not. And, you know, uh, that's okay, I guess, but in exchange, what are we getting? I have written that I think that uh, stormwater retention should be increased here. This is a flood area, and all they're proposing is one-year retention of uh, floodwaters on the site, uh, and yet their, 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 their coverage is extensive. This is infrastructure. This is what the planning board does. Um, and uh, there hasn't been any traction on this at all. Uh, I think that's not good. I think the site plan uh, issues that Tom and uh, that we've talked about before are critically important. I personally believe that uh, the parking is something that's got to be uh, resolved. I've asked for background. I, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely convincible if people can convince me, but the suppositions that people have made about parking, I think do not jive with our own personal experience. The reason there are, the towns are set up for these kinds of reviews with, with local ZBAs, local ERBs, local ARBs, local planning boards, is local experience matters. And the, leg the state legislature has, has said it's important that that local flavor, that local experience is, is brought to bear. So I think, you know, uh, from my standpoint, uh, I mean, you can tell me that this will work out in Kansas. You can tell me that uh, we want a walkable town, but this is not San Diego. We don't have the weather of San Diego. It's not as walkable as people think it might be. It's just not. Remember what happens in winter. Remember what happens in, in the summer where you, you go outside and it's 93 degrees and 400% humidity and you swelter within four steps. You're not walking then. So all these things... Um, I don't think have been proven out or, or submitted, and or, or rather, they just seem to be inconsistent with our own personal experience. We know better. We know that that's not the situation. We know that people are going to need cars, especially if they're going to live in you know in, in, in you know two bedroom apartments and paying I don't know four or five six thousand dollars a month in, in rent. You're going to have two cars. You need two cars. Someone's going to work. Someone you have to bring the kids to school. You have the teams. All this kind of stuff. You're not going to sit around and wait for the Westchester bus to come by once an hour. Uh, the, the train goes one way. It goes to the city or back. That's it. It doesn't help you going west. It doesn't help you going east. Uh, it's terrific going to the city. It's terrific going to White Plains, but that's it. It's limited. So it's, it's, the suppositions are such that they, to me, they haven't been convinced in what, um, in, a, in exchange for that tremendous benefit uh, from the petition that results, I think that we have a duty, I think we have a right, and I, I think the town should be getting something in exchange for it. And uh, I, I don't see it yet in, in the proposal, and I think what Tom has done here is tremendous work. The streetscape and making this a neighborhood, enabling a neighborhood, enabling future development to be consistent with this so that the North Greeley neighborhood is something that we would all want to be in, all want to live in, all want to enjoy is 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 critically important. So I, mean, I thank you for all the work. I'm a tremendous amount of work. Um, apparently, work doing other stuff that you should be doing. <laughs> but in any event, um, those are my feelings on it. I mean, some of my feelings on it. Um, it's it's. Um, 
I, I, I really think um, we are being convinced, uh, some folks are being convinced with this application based on a lot of advertising slick uh, expressions, etc. But when you dig through it, um, does it really make a difference to the community, to the residents of this town? Um, I think it could, I think it should, and I think it can be better. Um, I, I think everyone up here uh, supports this whole concept of multifamily housing, uh, diversity of housing. I will make this other statement. This, as far as I see, offers very, very little in terms of diversity of housing. It does nothing for senior housing. Senior housing is a critical need in this town. We have none. Having senior housing in a hamlet is where you would want to put it. I think it does very little or nothing for uh, workforce housing. Uh, we have four units of affordable housing. The rest is going to be market. You know it's going to be marketed for luxury with all the amenities and this kind of stuff. That doesn't strike me as diversity from diverse from our, our single family housing that we see throughout the place. So anyway, that's enough. Um, does uh, does Dick want to go? Dick, you want to talk? You don't have to. <clears throat> Can you hear us, Dick? You don't have to. I mean, I, I, I can go. Yeah, I hear you. <clears throat> I think we're, you were on a better track than we were several weeks ago. Um, this is very helpful that what Tom has done. Uh, I don't know how we present it to anybody that's really going to take it serious. Uh, that's that's the problem I'm having right now. We, we send messages and, uh, you know, they, they use it for making paper airplanes or something. <laughs> Um, yes. Uh, so I think that that's the, that's the thing to go. I think we have good ammunition. I mean, the finding of the, you know, the large septic uh, uh, piping uh, on the edge of the property somewhere. That's, you know, you got to be careful with that kind of stuff. You don't want to be going and uh, taking the, you know, a, an older pipe and uh, being in the prep in the area. Uh, this, what we just went through, it, it looks like, gee, this is good. A, a streetscape is important. I go back to white riding by, you know, the, the housing that en is at the entrance of Millwood. It, it is a streetscape. Great. It's really great. It really is a nice thing. And <clears throat> the, those accoutrements really make it more, um, let me see, better in people's thinking, I, I think. By the way, Dick, did, did you remember that the planning board actually did the design guidelines for that? <laughs> I do. I do. Yeah. It's, it's, um, but I didn't have much to do with it at that point, but it's, it, it, uh, it, it is good. It is good. And then we can find other situations, but you know, when you, when you did the 3d picture of what is being proposed, it, it looked like it was from another planet almost. And it didn't, it didn't uh, ring a bell with me for anything other than eh, it's a big blob and they don't know how many houses, I mean, how many uh, cars are going to be there. Uh, you know, in the, uh, uh, you know, the bicycles, if they're going to use the bicycles with uh, uh, the lithium, I, I think that should be banned. Uh, but, you know, New York City has only had 92 uh, fires, you know, from uh, January to, to the end of May. So maybe you'd take it, maybe only be one or two for us, uh, you know, for every three months or four months. So this looks cleaner. This looks, um, you might say, old fashioned in a way, but most towns in the past didn't have the uh, amount of, of um, you know, trees and, and uh, uh, you know, landscapes, uh, sidewalk scapes. It, it's just so much better in downtown Chappaqua than it was, you know, five years ago. So if we could hook in with that, then we have something. Now I'm going to go Betty Bye. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Dick. Uh, again, I just want to make <clears throat> one thing very clear. Uh, we're not in the design and build business. This is just throwing out examples, examples emphasizing what we think is 
uh, core uh, design consistent with the usual design guidelines. So streetscapes, what you see on the street, um, how you activate the streets, uh, whether it's three stories, four stories, you know, that'll be determined you know, later on. But, but it's, we're not designing a building. This, these are just, uh, it, it's just examples. So uh, you know, just real quick. Yeah, but how do we, who do we go to that would listen and be interested in having the thoughts that we've discussed today and other days, have them bring them out and say, well, okay, not this, this, yes, no, whatever. But right now, we are not part of the, uh, the landscape. Well, um, to, be, to be fair, there is a work group which has met twice, and we have been invited to that. Um, and I've attended two of them along with LDAD. Uh, my last um, session, um, I mean, I, I, I think I'm willing to, to you know, go to meetings and try and help where I can, but it just seems like we are starting from the wrong place in this. It seems like we should not be starting from a set of drawings that somebody brings in and you could take that set of drawings and turn it over to a to a team in your office and you would have a huge leg up on construction drawings. I mean, this thing is so far down the road in terms of actual construction drawings that they aren't very far away from issuing a set. And it's, it's a little bit uh, disturbing that we are working from that kind of uh, investment by somebody uh, sort of a hard investment, not only in terms of time and money, but a hard investment in terms of initiative and in terms of, of their feelings of, um, I don't want to say rights to do something, but their feelings of, of, geez, we're here, we've done all this, you know, now we need to do it. And we're, we're working from a position of, if, if we're negotiating, and I don't think we should be negotiating, if we're negotiating, we are negotiating a position of real weakness because so far, what we've got is we've got an extra 2,000 square feet of retail on the ground floor. And somehow, um, I guess that that's, we've checked off all the boxes. I don't know where we're going to go, with, but the kinds of things that need to be done here, I think, go far beyond anything that is being even thought of the town board so far in their discussions, and admit they have not had many discussions among themselves about what they're going to do. But it doesn't seem like these things are in any sort of discussion anywhere uh, with them at the scale of which the change in this proposal needs to happen. I think that we need to start by saying, this is the zoning text we are going to write for ourselves. And we are going to put that in place. And anybody who has the interest in building to that zoning code, we our arms are open. We are ready to go. Please come and work with us. That's how I think we ought to be proceeding. And the, the last memo we sent to the town board was a slight change. It wasn't a slight change, it was a very dramatic change, but I think it was a couple of paragraphs, proposed change to this draft zoning text. And the images that I showed tonight were literally that zoning text put into three dimensions. That's what that was. And I think that it's going to take a dramatic reset, I think, of people's impression of where we are understanding of where we are in this process. We do not have to take this proposal. There is nothing that obligates the town to build this proposal. Nothing other than somebody's perception that somewhere that we're obligated somehow. I don't know why. Uh, it does not make sense to me. And so that's why I did these images is try and as, as, as Dick is suggesting, try and move the dime a little bit and say, wait a minute, we're, we're working at this from the wrong end. Let's, yep. let's put, let's put the cart before the horse and, you know, put the horse before the cart mm -hmm. and let the cart follow. Because I promise you, you put zoning in place already. There's like eight, like there's 80,000 square feet, 80,000 square feet, gross square feet of conditioned space in this proposal. I think that the existing Rite Aid building is 10,000 square feet. So do the math. At the stroke of a pen, this town 
would be increasing the property value of that particular parcel by eight times. Now that's too simple, a, uh, probably too simple a calculation because there are costs that go into getting there, but that's an enormous change. And to me, that just flips the switch on all of a sudden this being a developable property that people are going to come in and want to develop. And maybe at the end, it's not 80,000 square feet because I think that's way too much for this property. Maybe it's 60,000 square feet, which is closer to what is in these images. That's still six times. So I, I, don't, I don't understand it. I just, I mean, I think I understand it, but I don't want to believe it that, that we just, we're, we're stuck and we, we aren't somehow aware enough to what's going on in order to just sort of shift. I mean, this says, 1791 can we wait a couple more years to get this you know to, to do it right because if this gets built in um in 23 24 or 2020 whatever 100 years from now can't do the math that building's going to be there because of what we did today i'm sorry um so uh, I wrote, took down some notes, and I, you know I have a lot of thoughts on on, on this topic, and um, I'm just appreciative of the opportunity to even have this discussion. Um, you know, I've said I think several times before, it's it's this type of project that made me want to join the planning board, um, and so um, I don't mind that it's late, and I appreciate that that there are several members of the public here, and and that several of you continue to come. To, to the public sessions on this, and, and, and um, that's great. This is, this is why we're here. Um, first of all, uh, I'm touched that you remember that uh, comment during the FB, that I made during the uh, FBC process. Uh, it's something that I think about a lot, right? Well, who are we building for, and, 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 and do these people have a voice? And so I'm, I appreciate that. Two, um, I, I uh, admire your willpower in not naming the restaurant in your own drawings at Tom's Diner. Um, I'm just naming it Chabagwa Diner. Um, and I also want to echo um, Bob's uh, sentiment that I, I very much appreciate the effort. I, I, I know how long it takes to put together that kind of uh, level of detail. And um, uh, so I know that it didn't, didn't happen, uh, you know, 10 minutes before the meet, this meeting happened. And so I really appreciate it. Yeah, so well. <laughs> Um, but I appreciate the effort that you and, and, and um, whether people agree or disagree with what you're uh, putting here, clearly you care and have made uh, an effort. Uh, and so I appreciate that very much. Um, there are areas that I, I personally agree, and I think a lot of us uh, on the board agree uh, with, with uh, a lot of the concerns you're raising, Tom, and there's some areas that, that, I, that I don't agree with, or at least, I mean, there are areas I definitely don't agree with and the areas that I just, I'm sort of indifferent to, and, and are not like uh, you know uh, hills that that I that I am willing to to die on. Um, I want to address some of those. Um, I, I do think, and you all know this, <laughs> um, that I am very supportive of multifamily housing in our downtown. I am not concerned about the height that's proposed here. Um, I'm not concerned about the density, and I'm not concerned about the reduction in parking, uh, either for the residential um, or for the commercial, although I'm slightly more concerned about the commercial. The residential is sort of what it is, and people are going to have to figure that out, but they, or, or they won't buy or rent these units. Um, so I think the asks, which are significant, they're absolutely significant. It's not eight to one, it's probably not even six to one, whatever it is. It is, it is a significant um, increase in, in value that, that is being requested here, which doesn't bother me. I don't think that uh, we owe, that, that, that we're owed that. I mean, that's what zoning is. Zoning gives and the zoning takes away, and so be it, as long as we think it's appropriate and beneficial to our town. I don't think it's sort of a zoning for dollars kind of thing. Uh, so the ask is okay, and I'm not afraid of increasing the value of a property as long as it increases the value of our town also, which I think there's the potential to do here. Um, I also want to acknowledge that in the last, I should have mentioned this up top, but in the last working group meeting that we had, um, the members of the town board that were present did 
suggest the possibility of in the near future, though the details weren't there, of addressing potential RFPs or RFEIs or, or, or proposals for the parking lot, the town owned parking lot across from Susan Lawrence. Um, and I think that's good because as we've all said, and we've said from day one, we cannot just think about 50 North Greeley as a project in a vacuum. It is part of a, a corridor that, that whether we acknowledge it or not, um, uh, the rest of the corridor will look to what's happening there. So if we're also going to be thinking about what's happening on, on, a, on a not insignificant piece of property that happens to be town owned across the street, I welcome that as well. Um, but that further stresses the point that we need to think about how we get this right, because it'll be hard to make a, an argument across the street if we weren't willing to stand for something that we believe in at 50 North Greeley. Uh, but I do appreciate that the town board raised that um, at our working group meeting, and I would love to follow up with them about that. Um, when it comes to areas that I agree with uh, the point, a lot of the points that you made, um, and you know this also, process, 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 process. This is, has been backwards from day one. Um, it remains backwards. I don't know if there's a willingness on the town board side to, to change that but it doesn't mean we need to stop talking about it. Um, the zoning has to come first for so many reasons, including, but not limited to, limited to the fact that one, the zoning talks about what's important to us. Just like you said, Tom, your visualization here is just a 3D visualization of what ultimately was text, right? And, 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 and spoke to our principles and our values. Two, this developer or any developer may come and go. And so the design that's promised um, it not, won't necessarily be delivered, but if our zoning is, is sound and in place and speaks to what is important to us, then we know we're going to be protected. Um, and so the process uh, to me has been problematic from, from the beginning. I don't know if we're going to be able to get there. I genuinely don't. I mean, yeah, the, the cart is before the horse, so is, is, is there a way to reverse it? I'm not sure. I think part of the issue, which, which we alluded to, Tom, is that the, the property owner and developer, which again are two different people here, which is, which is not uncommon, but it is relevant also, I think, because the developer can then decide, I, I, I'm good. I'm going to walk away. Then there's the property owner who still has to figure out what to do with this property. But um, there's this sort of pent up energy to develop this site. And maybe there's a feeling of, pardon the pun, but entitlement uh, in order to move forward with this proposal. Um, but then also, I, 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 there is it sort of, there is a, we need to be fair that there has been a long, uh, moratorium in place and um, you know we didn't put that moratorium in place we the town board the, the planning board but as sort of um, you know public servants for the town I have to acknowledge that I think that that's part of sort of the, the, the pressure to move forward here doesn't mean we need to do anything in response to that pressure or react or do anything that you know, violates how we feel, uh, you, know, you know, you know, what our duties are, but it's just, I think it's worth acknowledging. So the process and the zoning. Um, another area where I completely agree, and we've discussed this, and I think this is the only area where they heard a little bit about uh, our concerns at the working group was the ground floor issue to an extent, not all of it, not all the concerns at the ground floor, but just um, sort of the, uh, you, 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 Tom, wrote some draft zoning language that talked about, um, active uses to a minimum depth at the ground floor. Um, this revised proposal likely doesn't meet that language, but it, 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 it's a step in that direction. Um, but um, the other, so, so that's another area that I agree with you. Um, you know, I understand what you're saying about these, like what they're calling public courts. Uh, why they'll, they'll be in, in shade for much of the year. And, and I hear you. I, I don't think they will function as badly as, as, as you think, but um, I understand what you're saying. But so generally the idea of improving the design, the urban design, not the architecture, but the urban design 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis the ground floor and, 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 and where, where the public intersects with that, um, I think is, is critical, and I, have a, a, I very much agree with that. The other piece that I mentioned the other night, uh, I think at the working group, or maybe here, or maybe both, which I think is worth mentioning is why the zoning also matters, is um, we can put, we, we can, and from my perspective, should put zoning in place that speaks to what's important to us here. And if there's a design because of the uniqueness of this site or some other reason that that was, is at variance with that zoning, there are mechanisms to say, I'd like a variance from the zoning, and here's why. We understand your principles, and I would love to achieve those, but maybe in a slightly different way, as opposed to the reverse of what's happening here, a reverse, which is what's happening here. So I, again, I think why, I think process matters. Um, areas where I disagree with, with uh, some of the points that you were making, Tom, and I, I just want to put those on record because um, you know we agree a lot as a, as a board, but uh, don't agree on everything. Um, the architecture itself, um, yes, it's different um, than what exists here in, in, in Chappaqua and in Newcastle. Um, but I don't know that, for me anyway, that doesn't mean it doesn't belong here. Um, and, and, um, and it doesn't bother me, but also I, I'm much, much, me personally, much, much less concerned with architecture, specifically when it comes to this project. Um, so that, that part of it is, I understand your concerns with it, but it, it, it doesn't bother me. And, and, and in conjunction with that, the courtyards uh, above the ground floor, not, not the ground floor public spaces, but the courtyards, the private courtyards, and the distance between windows, I understand why that is a concern for you. Um, to me, that's more of like a private sector thing. If there are going to be people willing to buy those units, so be it. E you know, either they're luxury units or they are have windows that are too close to each other. To me, they, they, they can't really be both. Um, and so we'll see. I, I, I don't know exactly what, what, what that means, but I, I'm much less concerned, I've said this before, with anything that happens above the second, above the ground floor, second floor and up. Um, and um, yeah, and I mentioned the zoning for dollars thing. Like, to me, I don't feel that we're owed anything specifically just as a result of increasing the, um, the development potential of the site. I think that we need to do that if and when we think it's beneficial to us. And I think there's a way to do that here, us meaning the town. Um, because again, the, the, the location here matters significantly. It is in the hamlet. It's a big site. It will impact what's happening in the rest of North Greeley and the rest of our downtown. Um, it's walkable from um, the other walkable parts of our town, right? Uh, it's not walkable from too much, but it is walkable from as far away as the library and the train station and, um, you know, the middle school and um, the rest of, uh, uh, you know, town hall and where we are now and, 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 and the rest of the, the hamlet. Um, so that's, uh, those are my quick notes. Um, you know, I... Where does that leave us? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, there is another working group session that we have been invited to. I believe that's next week, if I'm not mistaken. Although, as you, yeah. as I, remember, I, I showed up here last night, so I might. Okay, well, I haven't, I haven't received the notice yet, but I think they want to do it relatively quickly. I think there's a date. It, it is next week. Okay, then I, I haven't been looking at my email, um, so I'll check that out. Thank you, Sabrina. I, I don't I, know that a I, notice has been set. I think you guys set the date at the last meeting, but I will make sure that everybody gets a notice tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, for that, I'm just, I, I, what are the expectations? Um, what are my expectations as a member of the planning board to come out of that meeting? And the first meeting, despite representations um, to the contrary, um, I thought that we uh, were not treated well. Um, the second meeting for me was like putting lipstick on it. Really not, for me, really not dealing with what the big issues are, which are the ones that we've been talking about here tonight. And so I have a little bit of concern about whether we are going to continue to participate in these and end up with really not enough to show for it and as a consequence i mean be implicated in a 
conclusion that we can't support. <clears throat> At least when we did the form-based code stuff, we sent memos in, which were very well considered, I thought. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought... Um, very detailed. Very detailed. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing that came back from that, as I recall. And at least in that case, we are not implicated because, you know, we did our duty and, and nobody listened to us and that's not our fault. So I, I'm just not sure yet. I mean, I'm, I'm not really convinced of the why the plane board should be going to meetings where the, when there's really not sufficient outcome, when actually the meeting is about the wrong thing rather than what we, I think, is the right thing, which is what we've been talking about. <coughs> so I don't want to necessarily give credence to that process for them to say, well, <coughs> you know, the planning board's involved, and <coughs> this, that, and the other thing. And the, the, I think the best venue is as getting to Dick's point would be, <coughs> you know, how do we get to, to be heard in a way which we think is maybe going to help is in a joint meeting of the boards uh, to have everybody there. Now, I know there's a the complaint, uh, not the complaint, but the concern that, well, you get too many people talking, nothing happens. And yeah, it's messy, but I mean, that's the nature of, you know, the way this country does business called democracy. We need to have everybody talking to everybody rather than somebody going to a meeting and then reporting back to somebody else what they think happened in the meeting. And that happens a lot. And I've witnessed it um, around here. And so I think that the best way to do it is to, is to and if you have a meeting like that, I think this room will have more people in it than the, than the, the stalwarts who are sticking <laughs> with us at uh, almost to midnight tonight. And thank you for being here uh, in order to get some, you know, get, get some tension. I don't know, tension is the wrong word, but some traction. I Yes, traction. So, I do you guys have any? I mean, this we're talking to ourselves. Do any of you have anything you want to say at this late hour? Yes. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> good night. <laughs> but nothing substantive. I have. You do come up somewhere. All right. As long as you know how to walk. Oh, that was a long night. Somebody said process. The key is let's establish what the process is and then and then stand for what the process is. And usually the process involves putting the horse in front and uh, and, and and directing the code. Um, but the process will design what we want for the code to be made. He made a form-based code. He showed us the forms of a code. Um, what was always missing in form-based code or even even in Tom's work, was um, more people involved with with not approving a plan, but working one out. And I, I just think one of the process would be to create a legitimate regulating plan that everybody could agree on. All the other stuff is secondary. Creating a regulating plan that everybody wants. And how do you do that? You, you facilitate. Um, a, you facilitate some regulating plan designs and, and, and you take yours and take, take mine and take a few others um, and see what happens. Then you have, a, you have a picture of what you want. That's when you can write the law. The process is building that regulating plan, the three-dimensional stuff, the thing that creates space. The regulating plan is key. And um, you have to figure out a way to get a regulating plan that everybody wants so you can write a code to it. Now, they're not, I don't think the town board is interested in doing it because they've never done it before. <laughs> and so, so we're really asking for something to, to be done when nobody knows what it's like or has ever, ever been trained or ever been facilitated. So we're missing out on a community communication. And I think so the process is key. We have to figure out how to get the process um, so that we can um, regulate something. <laughs> Do 
Is that someone has a hand? Oh, okay, sure. Please. Briefly. <laughs> Very briefly, please. Can you just unmute yourself? Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, bravo, Tom. Bravo, Planning Board. I agree with almost everything you've said, which is if you've been reading my mail. Um, I think you put it very well when you say that this, this project is not something we would recognize as Chappaqua. Uh, everything from the parking to the mass of the building to the density to just simply looming over people. The design itself, uh, it, it's its almost from another world to me. And I know that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but it is not a neighborhood. Um, I've attended, uh, I'm a 28 year uh, resident of Chappaqua. I've, I've attended many town board meetings uh, about this subject and working sessions. Um, it's, it, I have the feeling that uh, this design is going to happen the way things stand now with just say a few changes from the designer. And there's sort of a feeling of this is going to happen with a few changes or else. And I think you guys made the point that, uh, well, okay, or else this is not the, the only design on the block, so to speak. Um, uh, I have a few, uh, two questions. What, what happens? If you do propose uh, something with fewer uh, apartments and obviously less profit to the developer and the owner, uh, what happens there? Uh, and what authority does the planning board have? Because from what I'm hearing tonight and what I've heard in the past, it's as if sometimes the planning board is not listened to uh, and not seriously considered. Now, if I'm wrong, please tell me. Anyway, I just, uh, this has given me some hope uh, and I really appreciate the work and thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is John Polera. <clears throat> so, um, first of all, I want to thank you. Everything this gentleman said, I totally agree with. Thank you for your hard work and time because it really, I feel articulate so many of the things we actually really hate about this whole plan. And we feel, well, I feel that the developer and the property owner are kind of tone deaf to what Chappaqua is and how this would impact our community. Um, so when I saw your plan, it's like, wow, I can see myself you know, I can see myself in those pictures. I can see myself walking down that street, sitting in that cap, in that diner, or cafe, whatever. I can see myself there. His, you know, their their you know plan. It's not humanistic. It, it has no warmth to it. And Chappaqua is a hamlet. It, it just doesn't fit. So the one thing that to me, who you have to talk to are the council members. Those are the people you have to direct your energy at. And when we were here a couple of weeks ago, I kept hearing from the people who favored the plan. They, they, would, they would all say the same thing. Well, you have to start somewhere. And I think that's the attitude of the council. You have to start somewhere. But you're going to start, you know, the cornerstone of, of the center of town development with a lousy plan, that's how you start somewhere? Doesn't make any sense. That's what I want to say. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Bob Lewis. It's, uh, it's wonderful uh, what you have, have started, Tom. Um, and what the town board is, uh, what the planning board is doing here. I, you have a really tough, uh, tough problem because you have an application before you, and yet you're, the, the, the thing that Tom is trying to do is to come up with a way of 
stepping back from the immediate problem of an applicant to look at how to how the town can give applicants a statement of what the town wants it to be <laughs> what the town what is a direction a good direction for the town for very, for specific places in town that's what zoning is so zoning always has an ordinance which is rules and how that those rules are to be applied to specific locations so there's a zoning map and when we were working on the uh, comprehensive plan we specifically avoided any discussion of specific locations we couldn't talk about specific properties we couldn't talk about the intersection at lower king street and Greeley Avenue. We couldn't talk about, well, what do we do about this location? Because it was just too tough a problem. We were more interested in, well, we talked a little bit about uh, transit-oriented development and things like that. But now you have the problem, and we couldn't avoid it really then, and now we can't avoid it here. How do you talk about North Greeley. How do you talk about a real project that somebody wants to do without talking about it? And so you've come up with an idea that's an alternative to this real project. And you're stepping on eggshells because somebody owns that property and hey, they think they have a right to develop that property. And it's tough. Uh, now, ideally, we would talk about other ways that that property might de be developed. I mean, we're talking, I don't want somebody talking about my property, and but sure enough, you actually, if you're a designer, you have to come up with dozens of ways. You do come up with dozens of ways of thinking about what is a good way to do this project. And you quickly eliminate the bad ones, and you come up with two or three that are good ideas, and you think about them a little more, and eventually one of them wins. And so for this applicant, he picked the winner for him, and came up with his idea and presented it to you. Well, maybe the town needs to do some of that for themselves. And I think that's the question that Rich asked earlier. How do we, who do we go to to make those decisions? Somebody in the town has to take the ball. I think that the statute, the, the state, tells us that it's the planning board that makes those decisions. They, they, they do the master planning. Uh, that's, that's the way it was uh, when I was on a master, on, on a planning board. So um, um, the, in this particular case, um, this is, first of all, as Bob pointed out, this is not an application or an applicant. This is a who would, under a existing zoning, come in with a building proposal through the building department and we would be responding as a planning board to an applicant. This isn't that. This is a petitioner going to the town to get rezoning for his property. Hmm. In the former, the applicant has certain rights, certain property rights, certain procedural rights that are in place for very good reasons. In the case of a petitioner, and the town has to hear that, and we have to deal with that, in the case of a petitioner, they're just coming in and asking for a favor. And the town could just, uh, they could just say, I'm sorry, we are, aren't interested. So um, I'm not saying the town should do that, but I'm saying I think that's the difference between the two. And I just want to say that that's a, a critical difference for the images that you saw tonight. Because I'm an architect, and I sit on the planning board. And if this was an application, there's no way in the world I would have done those drawings. Because, if, I mean, I've had lawyers tell me not to, I mean, Les Simon was famous for saying, 
don't do that kind of a thing because you're you're tipping the scale unfairly and you're getting yourself into trouble. But this isn't that. This is something else. The other reason that um, that it, that I can do this as an architect is typically, ethically, an architect never draws on another architect's job. You just don't do that. Um, but this is different because I'm not drawing on the other architect's job to get that commission. I am representing another client, which is the town, helping them come to a decision. And so there are distinctions here that are important. I can see that people out there, you know, the, the, the applicant and his architect may get really upset. Now, I don't understand. I don't blame them for getting upset. Maybe they don't care. But there's an important distinction there. I'm serving the town. Well, I also heard you were doing. heard you uh, trying to create a vocabulary for the town of how of an old, of a way of designing a street frontage and populating a street front that might be useful. Yes. For other places, I mean, it might be that street, but it could be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So you want to have a group of people writing zoning? Is that something that you said? I'm sorry? Are you, are you trying to create a group of people or to find a group of people to develop a new zoning for the town? Is no. that what you said? No, I think that that's properly in the hands of the, of the, of the town board. That's what they do. Right. Um, and they, they have public meetings and they take referrals from us and other people and then they make up their mind. And I think that the, that part of the process. But you're, are you saying that the way to get to a statement of how to, uh, how to implement these new ideas would be to have new zoning? Well, they, they, the petitioner sent in yes. a proposed zoning law and um, what we have been commenting on for several months is we don't think uh, first of all we think that design is something that should be looked at at the same time or with zoning and, and equally it's not so far and uh, along by also a seeker but also uh, very importantly um, I lost my train of thought because it's late um, and I'm old um, but the, it's, it's a petition that's in, and um, what we have done is we have submitted uh, comments on the proposed zoning law, and we've actually offered some potential changes to the law that, that the petitioner sent in. So the town board is, is free to dismiss it altogether from us or from the applicant. Uh, it's a petition. And so it's it's really just a referral to us. They had, it's, it's all uh, before the town board. The town board's going to make the decision on this. Uh, we are in this uh, in this project and, and this kind of uh, procedure. We're just a referral board, so we don't have any ability. Uh, we propose that to change that also in the zoning law, so that we would have site plan jurisdiction as we did, for example, the Chapel Crossing. So you've already done some. We've done some of that stuff, yeah. And, 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 it hasn't gone too far. It's going Thank well. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and the, the reason these images uh, have been done is because we go to meetings and we write memos and we go to meetings and it's like there are drawings at the meetings and we're here with sock puppets. And you cannot, you can't fight a drawing which is on the table. You can't fight a model if you don't have a model. And this is a, this is a, you need visual aids in order to talk about visual things. And so that's why these images were done to give the visual to the text that we've been, that we've been doing. That's its purpose. Hi, Hi my name is Maggie Ferguson. Um, given the late hour, just make some brief comments. First of all, I'd like to thank you for all the tremendous effort that went into the, to the presentation. Uh, one thing, and, and for all your comments, your very thoughtful comments, including Dick's, and every, I agree with 
is something that each of you said. And you know, to me, the greatest shame of this whole situation is the lost opportunity. We're doing all this for more luxury housing. It just blows my mind, given all the talk about bringing diversity of housing. That is not what this is doing. Yes, it brings more apartment rentals, which is fine, but aside from that, no. And uh, I agree that senior housing and middle income housing are, are sorely lacking in this community. What an asset it would be to have something for those people in our town, near transportation, near the community center. It, it would be wonderful, but that's not what this is. And what it is is, you know, something from outer space, if you ask me, being plunked down in the middle of the most socially, or on the edge of the most socially, uh, economically and socially diverse neighborhood. I've talked to a number of people there who rent there, and they think they're going to be priced out. It's just the way it happens. Um, they're scared. They have kids in the schools. Um, you know, this is what, these are the people who come up to us at the farmer's market. So I think it's a terrible shame, and it's going to flip a gentrification switch um, that's just going to keep going and going and going. And it's also contrary to the number one goal of the comp plan, which was years in the making, and this is 2017, it's now 1970, and it's been lauded as a wonderful comp plan, which is uh, development in the neighborhoods should be in the scale and density of those neighborhoods, and this is not that. They have a law that says it is, but that's a fallacy, it's a lie, and it's baked into the law. And I personally think it's insulting to the community to try to do something like that. Um, my last comment is please keep fighting for the community. I know it's frustrating and I know you feel like you're not being heard, but I certainly know that feeling. And I ask you to keep fighting and hanging in there. And thank you very much. Great, thank you. All right, anyone else? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to go past midnight. No, 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 no. <laughs> we used to. Yeah, we used to do that a lot. Okay, well, uh, no, no further comments. Is there a motion to close the meeting? Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.